Yeah, I'm not going to wait for the other microphone, so <laughs> we'll do it the old style. Is it working? I think so. Can you guys hear me? Okay, good. The more importantly, the camera can ch capture this. I think this was a classic example of the trade-off between reliability and performance. <laughs> you get an error, it takes such a long time to handle it. As a result, you're, you get delayed, right? I think all these trade-offs happen in real life as well as computing. But this was a very avoidable trade-off, I think. If we had redundancy here, I think that could have fixed it. Now we're, 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 we're at a suboptimal solution, which is not necessarily the best thing. As you can see, I'm going to juggle, and I don't know which one I'm going to press now. OK, so we're going to continue what we started, uh, main memory and DRAM fundamentals. Today, I have to leave uh, for the train station a bit early, so we may not take a break, but we'll probably end at 2.35 or so. I'll try to take a small break in, in between still. But feel free to ask questions, I think. Uh, and last time, actually, which was interesting, somehow uh, my, my brain was programmed to end the lecture at 2.30. I don't know why, <laughs> but apparently somehow my brain was programmed wrong. <laughs> Because it was supposed to end at, at 3, right? I think some of you were surprised. Why did we end at this time? So there's another error <laughs> mechanism. OK, it's good to understand these error mechanisms. And that's true for memory as well as everywhere in the world as too, I think. OK, so what are we going to uh, This was last lecture. We wrapped up caches. Uh, we talked about main memory and its importance. And we talked about a lot of main memory trends and challenges. We're going to continue on that. We're going to wrap up main memory challenges talk about some fundamentals, DRAM basics and operation. And then we're going to go into memory controllers, cover simulation a little bit, how to evaluate ideas. And then we'll start with memory latency. And tomorrow, we'll talk about memory latency. OK, that's going backward. So we're talking about the main memory system. This is jog your memory. We were talking about why is memory so important, especially today. And we gave four different perspectives, right? The performance perspective energy perspective, reliability perspective, and the security perspective. And these are somewhat combined, although not necessarily all the time. Right? A lot of the reliability problems lead to security problems, but they don't have to. And security problems don't necessarily get caused by reliability problems, but they're very intermingled when uh, they cause issues together. And we talked about some trends, challenges, and opportunities in main memory. And this is, again, to jog your memory. This is one slide that we covered. It's the memory stupid. People know that for a long time, but maybe we need to do something about it. Uh, energy perspective, uh, reliability perspective. Reliability is becoming worse. Energy is becoming worse. Per so performance is also becoming worse because we're designing better processors, but they're still waiting for memory. Uh, and security is not uh, becoming easy. It's becoming worse. And I recommended some papers, as you can see. This is one of them. But in order to see the papers, you should look at the previous lecture. So we were also covering trends, challenges, and opportunities. And we covered that. And now let's, uh, this was the last slide we ended up with, right? Basically, how do we solve the memory problem? And this course will focus a lot on the memory problem. One of them was to fix memory and controllers more intelligent, design new interfaces, maybe new functions inside memory, new architectures. I call this a system memory co-design, as we discussed. The second solution that we're going to also explore is eliminating or minimizing the problem, looking at different technologies that may or may not have these, some of these problems. And this enables new technologies and system-wide rethinking of memory and storage. Like phase change memory is a very good example where we're going to talk about, and we may talk about some other technologies too. And the third solution direction could be embracing uh, the problem and say, especially some parts of the problem, and say, OK, we're not going to be able to design a memory that's good at everything. So why don't we design heterogeneous memories? And some of them are good at something. Some others are good at some other things. And then we put them together and map data intelligently across them. And this could lead to new models for data management and maybe usage. For example, if you have a memory that's extremely reliable, and if you have some other part of memory that's not so reliable, how do you manage your data now across those memories? That's just the reliability dimension, right? You could have the energy performance, bandwidth, latency, all of those other dimensions. OK, there may be another solution direction here. And if you have an idea, uh, let me know. But all of these actually require thinking a bit broadly. Uh, there is no easy way, if you will. If you, if, when we go into these directions, you will see that uh, all of them require some cooperation between software, hardware, and devices. So we need to think broadly and out of the box a little bit. Uh, 
let's, let's take a look at these bro uh, uh, different solution directions with, with some broad strokes, and then we'll go into the fundamentals as I discussed. But it's good to have this high-level perspective first before we study uh, the basics. So what is, new, uh, what is this first solution direction? Basically, this is fixing it. How do we fix uh, the memory? Over we would like to overcome the memory shortcomings with more memory-centric system design. Today, the systems we're designing are more processor-centric. Everything is processed in, uh, in memory. And memory is kind of ignored, if you will. We'll, you'll see that more of this when we talk about processing in memory. Uh, so we would like to look at novel memory architectures, new interfaces, new functions. New interfaces meaning memory today, if you want to access memory, you just do a read, write, OK, maybe a refresh. But that's not that interesting. Refresh is overcoming some disadvantage of some particular technology, right? But the meaningful things that you do are read and write. Right? That's it. You cannot express any higher level functionality. You cannot tell memory, memory, search this data structure inside yourself and give me, I don't know, the result I'm looking for. There's no such interface to memory, neither in software nor in hardware. So this is the kind of interface that I'm uh, thinking about. And maybe put some functions inside memory. memory. Tell memory, memory, please compress this part of the uh, uh, data that you're storing for me and use this compression algorithm. And then you forget about it, right? So this doesn't exist today, but this could actually get rid of a lot of the data movement, like the waste that we have in system today. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a lot of this. We're gonna talk about better waste management, more efficient utilization of memory. Uh, like when we talk about latency tomorrow, we will see that a lot of the latency is wasted because even though uh, uh, the memory can respond to data much faster, we're specifying the latencies for, to cover for the worst case. For example, uh, Today, DRAM, memory, DRAM latencies are specified such that the memory operates correctly at 85 degrees Celsius. But if you're really operating memory at a much lower temperature, you can access memory much faster. You don't need to wait for that long. But the memory controllers obey this interface that says, oh, you gotta wait for this long. So that's a lot of waste, basically. So you can do better waste management, you can more efficiently utilize this, this sort of margin that you have in memory. That's one example. The other example could be, what are we storing inside the memory? Right? Some, some studies have shown that uh, on the workloads of the day that they examined, more than 30% of the memory is dedicated to zeros. So you buy this eight gigabyte chip, 2.4 gigabytes contain just zeros. Is that efficient? Maybe not, right? Maybe there's a better way of encoding these zeros inside memory and you don't store them or you store minimally, right? So that's a lot of waste, basically. It's good to think about these different uh, waste that we have in memory and come up with solutions to it. And this is a very fertile area right now because people really have not thought about this for a really long time. Why? From my perspective, it's the mindset a little bit. Okay, we're, we're designing the processors and processors is the most important thing, so let's optimize it. But wait, <laughs> it's the memory stupid, right? <laughs> Okay, so there are key issues to tackle. I think we're going to cover a lot of these. We talked a lot about, uh, about reliability. We're going to talk about it more. How to enable reliability at low cost is important. And this enables high capacity, of course, with high reliability. Reducing energy is, very, is going to be important. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And I think these two comes, uh, come at, uh, they're at odds with each other, right? Enabling reliability. You can enable more reliability by increasing energy, like adding error correcting codes, adding more refresh, to DRAM just like we saw with Rowhammer. So okay, there's a trade-off. How do you handle the trade-off? So memory design is all about trade-offs. Uh, well, that's clearly true with, for everything, but here the trade-off space may be very large today. Reducing latency, we're gonna talk a lot about that. Again, reducing latency is, could go at odds with reliability because if you reduce latency, you may start getting errors because you may not satisfy the timing uh, of the circuit anymore. Then the key question is how do you actually reduce latency while being reliable at the same time? Reducing latency is usually good for energy actually. So it's good to understand these interactions because if you reduce latency, you're activating things for a much shorter amount of time. You're driving less power uh, over time, right? Uh, okay, uh, improving bandwidth, that's also important for reasons that we discussed earlier. We're gonna talk about that and reducing waste. I just give you some examples. And I think one thing that could enable a lot of these things at the same time is enabling computation close to data. We're going to move to that uh, in the next few lectures over time. So this is a very broad slide as you can see, but this I think summarizes very clearly some of the key challenges that we have in memory today. But it's always good to think about these different uh, dimensions.
So we're going to cover a bunch of papers, some of which you're going to read. Uh, these are some of the papers that my research group is writing, has been writing since we started working in this area. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to include the 2018 papers here, so I, I ran out of time. But uh, there are a lot of really interesting, uh, a lot of really interesting research uh, going on over here. We'll, we'll, we'll sample some of these, I think. Uh, not all of them. If we, if we went through all of them, I think that'll be a full course. <laughs> Okay, so the second solution direction, which is also, uh, in my opinion, equally uh, interesting, uh, and we should pursue multiple solution directions in research as well as uh, product design, right, uh, is uh, looking at uh, more, uh, some, uh, some other technologies that may not have some of these problems, right? And there are some other technologies, they're called emerging technologies, uh, that they're more scalable than DRAM in terms of how much, uh, how many bits you can put per area, at least over time. Uh, and in terms of cost scaling also, uh, because they're fundamentally different. They're resistive. So they're, they're, uh, they don't store charge. Uh, they basically uh, cap, uh, you encode data based on the resistance of some material. And they're non-volatile. I, I discussed uh, PCM, phase change memory, in the past. I'm not going to go over this in detail right now, but we're going to have a lecture that talks about some of these technologies and how to incorporate them, how to enable them in a real system, because it's a real challenge. As I said in an earlier lecture, the phase change memory is nice, and it's an old technology. Uh, basically, you store data by changing the phase of some special material, and you read data by detecting that material's resistance. It's an old technology. We, all, uh, we, we knew about this material for a long time, but we didn't know how to read its resistance at very high speeds reliably. And recently, there have been developments that enable that uh, reading read device, if you will. And people have, uh, especially IBM, for example, dem demonstrated prototypes as early as 2008 uh, 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 at two, 20 nanometer feature size. And DRAM at that time was much larger. Actually, it was around 35, 40 nanometers or so. Uh, and uh, I think this number is revised. This was a projection in 2009. They said you could scale this down to nine nanometers without a lot of reliability issues. Take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Uh, I think this is going down, so it's, it's very promising. And it's expected to be denser than DRAM for another reason also, in addition to the dimensions of the circuit that you can reduce it to. But you can also store multiple bits per cell, which means that uh, in a given resistance range, you can chop up that resistance range to four, let's say, and then you can say, oh, this resistance range uh, encodes zero, zero, this resistance range encodes zero, one, dot, dot, dot. So you can encode actually two bits per cell, uh, and people have shown that you could do three bits per cell as well. This is very difficult to do in DRAM because charge, charge is very elusive. If you're sensing the charge, is not very easy. So you could actually uh, chop up the capacitance range of the capacitor uh, from zero to whatever capacitance is. First of all, that's a very small range in DRAM today. Uh, and, the sec and, the, and second, it's very hard to sense uh, the in intermediate point. So they were sensing basically, is it charged or discharged, right? Of course, there are intermediate points uh, in there. Okay, basically you could do it, but your sense amplifier needs to be extremely capable. And once you're, if you design a sense amplifier that looks like that uh, to sense the different uh, values of charge, uh, it's, it becomes very vulnerable to noise and it also becomes huge. That's the downside. Already sense amplifiers that try to distinguish between a zero and one are huge. The size of a sense amplifier is more than 100 times the size of a single DRM cell. So if you actually uh, try to chop it up into a more finer grain pieces, it could be 1,000 times of a DRAM cell. So these sense amplifiers are actually dominating uh, the circuit in DRAM. Okay, the problem is emerging memory technologies have many shortcomings as well. The key question that we're going to ask is, can we somehow enable them to replace, augment, or maybe even surpass DRAM? Why surpass? Because they could, they're non-volatile, right, some of them. So if they're non-volatile, you may surpass DRAM because DRAM is not non-volatile. You can make it, by, by, by getting rid of refresh as much as possible, you can make parts of it look like non-volatile, but full non-volatility is not easy. Okay, so uh, we're going to cover some works in that also. This is a more emerging area, so there, this, this slide is not full yet. So I'll ask my students to make it full, maybe. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But there are a lot of interesting works in this area, basically, certainly. Uh, and we're going to cover some of them. So as I said earlier, there is no memory technology that's good at every single metric that we want. And this is one, uh, as a result, one, uh, whenever you think of uh, complementary memory technologies, you, could, you should think of heterogeneity. So ha looking at heterogeneous or hybrid memory systems is a very good solution direction going forward, and we're going to talk about that. The idea over here is basically 
put multiple different technologies uh, attached to a single node in this case and design the hardware and the software to manage the data allocation and movement to achieve the best of those technologies as much as possible. To basically exercise the greens as much as possible while avoiding the reds as much as possible. So for example, if this thing wears out over here when you write to it, maybe you don't write to it as much. Maybe you direct the write requests to DRAM, which doesn't wear out as, as far as we know. Uh, and yeah, that's one example. Right? For, you can direct your latency critical request to DRAM whereas latency, not so latency critical request to phase change memory. So this sort of uh, heterogeneous or hybrid memory system is already happening and it's going to happen even more uh, going forward. It, it could actually go into the CPU as well because there are benefits of some of these technologies like uh, uh, non-volatile uh, memory technologies uh, to be used as a non-volatile cache, non-volatile area inside the CPU that could have benefits in terms of security but that could also have benefits in terms of not going off chip, right, uh, for, uh, for persistent data structures. Okay, so this is a very exciting area. We're gonna talk about this also. I'm just giving you a broad overview. So I'll give you one other example of this. Basically, if you have heterogeneous memory technologies, you can design them such that they can match the heterogeneous requirements of applications, right? So this is a pictorial uh, high-level view. Applications essentially have different vulnerabilities in terms of memory errors, right? So, uh, if you inject a memory error to a particular uh, data uh, structure in an application, uh, the vulnerability may be high. Basically, you get a crash of the system because you actually modified a pointer that really is critical for the system to operate. Whereas another piece of data may not be that vulnerable, uh, like a video uh, or, or some image, a bit a pixel in the image. So if you can somehow classify these as vulnerable and tolerant, you could actually map them to different technologies that you also design with these requirements in mind. And there's a huge design space, of course, over here, which I'm not gonna go over right now, but we're gonna talk about uh, this work, heterogeneous reliability memory, that covers, that at least introduces the idea and initiates this design space. So this is actually very interesting, I think, because this is really uh, application memory co-design uh, within the memory space. Right? And this is looking at the aspect of reliability. So, Maybe most of your data is low cost and uh, uh, most of your data is very tolerant to errors. So you can put it in this low cost memory that has some errors potentially, hopefully some bounded error rate. And some of, uh, a small amount of your data is really critical in terms of reliability and security. And you gotta, you gotta keep them uh, reliable. And maybe you put it on a technology that's designed especially for reliability. And as a result, it may be low, high cost, right? So we did the study, uh, I'll point you to that paper. Uh, uh, one of my students who recently graduated, Yishin, did an internship at Microsoft and he basically showed that by uh, modifying the web search workload such that you partition different regions of the data uh, in terms of their reliability requirements and map them to different types of memory, uh, then you can actually reduce the server hardware cost in the data centers by about 4.7%. In this case, we were actually focused on reducing the server hardware cost because if you look at the data centers, they, mo most of the data centers use ECC memory. And uh, people have been for a long time thinking that, oh, this is such a waste because most applications don't use it. And this was the first study that actually showed that uh, you, uh, you, you don't actually need all that ECC in the data centers. Other studies in the previously showed that applications are actually tolerant to errors. Uh, so, uh, this work actually builds on those studies that show that applications are tolerant to errors. As a result, you can get rid of a lot of the ECC in your data centers by intelligently partitioning your data across these different types of memories. So hopefully that makes sense. You could actually make use of this in other ways as well. And there's a huge uh, area uh, of research as well as product design that, has open, uh, that is open right now. I find it fascinating. <laughs> because you could also uh, achieve a single server availability target of 99.9% .9 if you do this. You could argue that's good enough or not good enough. But these applications also have tolerance at the higher levels of the stack. They're distributed applications. So maybe if you have an error in this node, you can tolerate that error in this other node, right? You could argue that that's very wasteful. Yes, it is wasteful. Unfortunately, that's how things are designed today. Maybe there's, there are other system design choices. So very, whenever you send a request to, uh, as a web search, it actually touches many, many servers. Maybe that's wasteful, right? That's another, another waste that we may talk about sometime, but not necessarily right now. 
Okay, so this is the paper. You might be interested in taking a look at it. So we're, we're going to also, uh, after we cover some of this, we're going to talk about orthogonal issues like memory interference. It doesn't matter what technology you use or what is, he, what is sitting here. It is hybrid, heterogeneous, STTM RAM, PCM, DRAM, doesn't matter. If you have computation units that are sharing main memory and they're interfering with each other uh, because this medium is shared, you may have interference that is uncontrolled. And if, if you don't control this interference, uh, and if you don't mitigate it somehow, this leads to many problems. It could lead to quality of service issues for some core that really needs some latency requirements. It could lead to performance problems because maybe you're prioritizing one core for a long time and uh, you're denying service to many other cores. Like we talk about memory performance attacks, that's the key problem, right? We're going to go deeper here. Uh, basically, memory interference between cores is uncontrolled and this leads to issues. Uh, uncontrollable, unpredictable, vulnerable system. So we're going to explore the uh, direction of quality of service awareness in the memory systems. And the fundamental idea is you add some quality of service, notion of quality of service or fairness into the hardware and you make it configurable such that the uh, system can take advantage of it because in the end the requirements are not really known to the hardware, the system actually knows what the user wants, assuming that's communicated to the, uh, to the system of course. So we're going to look at application of our memory scheduling, partitioning, and throttling. And also we're going to look at how to take advantage of it. Software is designed to configure the resource to satisfy different quality of service goals. Okay, basically we would like to provide predictable performance and higher efficiency. And this problem is not getting easier also. This problem is getting much worse actually in existing systems. That's why uh, some, some of these SOCs are uh, some of the first systems that incorporate uh, fair and quality of service of our memory scheduling. These memory controls that you have in the, in the SOCs, they actually have a lot of bells and whistles to ensure that uh, you provide uh, different guarantees to different agents that are sharing the memory system. So clearly we're getting more agents, more CPUs, more GPUs, hardware accelerators, many kinds. And if you look at the system, memory controller is at the center of it. They all go through a memory controller. <laughs> And that memory controller, maybe multiple of them, uh, they control a DRAM and other hybrid memories. And if you keep increasing this part, uh, you need to do something about the memory controller. So a key question we're going to ask is how do you allocate resources to these heterogeneous agents to mitigate the interference that they have while providing predictable performance? And not all of them have the same requirements, so knowing their requirements will be important. Also, I, uh, as I said, uh, this problem is in all memory controllers, right? There are other memory controllers like cache controllers that need to do something similar perhaps because this may be a shared resource. And even in the CPU, if you have a multi-threaded CPU, you may be sharing uh, the L1 cache over there, right? And some people have been proposing sharing registers. It's not clear if that's worth it, uh, but it could be beneficial if threads access each other's registers sometimes, right? Uh, that's not the model today. Uh, but it could be beneficial, but you could actually share a lot of resources inside the CPU, not just the caches, but also the pipeline, right, if multiple threads are running at the same time. Okay, so one of the things that we are going to strive for is providing strong memory service guarantees. I think this is where the research is heading in this direction, and it's really important. Uh, this is one of the reasons why people actually uh, have a lot of waste in data centers. So you want to locate multiple different applications on a single node, such that you can utilize that node really well. But they all have different quality of service requirements. Now, if you don't have a substrate that ensures that you can get the quality of service requirements, what, what you would do is you would not put them together. Right? That's essentially what's happening in many data centers today. People are not putting different applications with quality of service requirements together on a single node because they don't know the effects. As a result, you have this partitioning of the data centers across different applications, and that leads to a lot of waste uh, as well. Uh, okay, so if we can satisfy the performance and SLA service level agreement requirements in the presence of shared main memory, heterogeneous agents, and hybrid memory and storage, that'd be great. So how do we do it? There are multiple approaches. We're going to examine one approach, for example. Can we somehow model uh, and uh, accurately estimate the performance loss of an application in the presence of resource sharing? Basically, how much did we lose performance? And performance can be done in multiple ways. The harder thing is how much did you lose compared to a reference machine, for example? What is your slowdown? I think that's very interesting. But you could also say, oh, how, how far are we behind in terms of the latency guarantees? What is the latency that we're experiencing? And what are we getting at this point? That could be also translated to bandwidth, right? Um, but I think slowdown is very nice uh, because that gives you an overall view. So someone can, for example, profile the application on a machine and say, oh, this is the performance that I like and I would like to get that performance. 
And if you can actually monitor and see how much of that performance you're getting, now you can actually manage the resources, basically. You can say, if you, if you also have the appropriate mechanisms and hardware and software to enable resource partitioning and prioritization inside the hardware, you can say, oh, this application is not satisfying its performance requirements, so maybe I should give it more cache or more, ban more memory bandwidth. So these two are both important, figuring out where you're falling behind or how much slack you have, if you think about it the other way around, right? Slack means you have some performance requirement, but you're meeting it easily. So how much more can you delay this application such that it's, it still meets the performance requirements, right? So that's the trade-off you can have. You can actually use, if you, if you have applications with Slack, you can delay them, and you can use the resources that they're using for other applications that are not meeting their requirements. So that's the basics of uh, uh, quality of service management, if you will. So we're gonna see some of those techniques to do that. I think there, there needs to be a lot more in this area because there's another constraint, which is you want to have high system performance, right? If, if this is not a constraint, then this problem is really easy. Just dedicate resources for a particular application and ma make sure that they, uh, the resources are enough uh, for, for that application to satisfy performance, but that, that leads to waste. Right? Our overall, we want high system performance and efficiency. That's not a high performance system uh, if you dedicate resources because if you look at all your overall aggregate peak system performance, you're utilizing only very little of it if you're partitioning resources across different applications, right? So sharing resources are actually good for uh, using the performance that you have. Okay, we're gonna look at some papers over here. Uh, these are example of more recent works uh, from uh, one of my other PhD students who's right now uh, at Intel. Actually, he moved to Facebook. She moved to Facebook. People move different companies these days. <laughs> okay, any questions? So I think I've given you the broad stroke of what we're going to cover, at least in the next few lectures or so. Do you know the answer to this question? <laughs> okay. Well, I think basically this is the plan of action. If we, we're trying to, we're going to ask, try to answer at least part of this question. Maybe we don't have the full solution, but we're, we'll talk about uh, some of the answers that people have been developing to this question. Basically, we, we first need to understand the principles, I think, of how memory and DRAM operates and other technologies also, and memory controllers, how do they operate. Techniques for reducing and tolerating memory latency, I think that's going to be important, uh, and potential memory technologies that can compete with DRAM. And I'm going to take a detour, hopefully today, but we'll see how far we can make progress. Uh, probably not today, given where we are. Uh, how to evaluate new ideas in memory systems. We're gonna talk a lot about simulation. Uh, because if you want to enable a future uh, that's very complex, you have to resort to simulation. And then the key question is, how do you actually simulate the system, right? What, what level do you simulate? Do you do gate level simulation for every single option that you have? Or do you do a much higher level simulation? Okay, we'll see uh, the trade-offs. Or do you build a system? Like maybe you have a, a million different options. Do you build a million different systems and test? Good luck with that. That's not going to uh, be very easy. Okay, uh, so this is what we will cover in the next lectures. So let's start with the main memory fundamentals since you don't have questions. And this is my fundamental slide for main memory. <laughs> Basically, all memory looks like this at some level. Uh, you supply it an address. Uh, okay, there's a chip enable. Maybe not all memory has chip enabled, but that's fine. There is a write enable, and you get data. Right? If you enable the write enable, you, uh, put, put, you put the data into that address. So this is bidirectional. And you have some number of locations, and uh, the memory gives you k bits. That's the abstraction level, right? And actually, if you go into memory, it consists of multiple blocks, smaller blocks that also look like this. And if you go into that, that consists of multiple smaller blocks that also look like this. <laughs> so it's like a snowflake. Whenever you go inside, it looks the same. <laughs> it's hierarchical, basically, using the same block. Give or take a couple of uh, other things. Basically, this is an example, right? We covered this. This is essentially your bank. It looks like this, right? There's no difference. It operates at the row granularity. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but it's a two-dimensional structure. And memory is almost always composed of these two-dimensional structures. And you need to control them. You need to supply address, get data, and some control bits. So fundamental concept, very quickly, we've covered this in digital circuits. Physical address space, this is the maximum size of main memory, total number of uniquely identifiable locations. Addressability is minimum size of data in memory that can be addressed. You could be byte addressable, it could be word addressable, it could be 64-bit addressable, right? 
How do you get that? And this could actually depend uh, on the physical structure, right? For example, in a DRAM uh, bank, whenever you do an activate, you address the entire row. But whenever you do a read, you actually get a, get a single byte. Right? So it really depends on the physical structure and what command you're sending to DRAM. But at the, at the ISA level, instruction set architecture level, uh, we, see, we usually see byte addressable memories. For example, MIPS ISA operates on bytes, right? Uh, of course, you have uh, things that operate on words also, but memories, uh, if you look at the ISA level specifications, byte addressable. Underneath, it could be different. Yeah, uh, I already said this, I think. Microarchitectural micro addressability depends on the ad abstraction level of the implementation, like, and also wherever you're in the memory structure. Alignment, we're not going to cover alignment as much, but this should be something that you should be cognizant of. You may have unaligned accesses. Things may not always be nice, right? Whenever you're requesting a cache line, for example, first of all, uh, that cache line may span, uh, whenever you're requesting, let's say, four bytes, that four bytes may not be aligned to a cache block. It may actually be unaligned across two different cache blocks. And somehow you need to bring two different cache blocks into the processor to be able to do that. Now that has a lot of implications, right? That may be unaligned uh, inside the memory also. You may be unaligned inside the row buffer. You may be unaligned inside the page table. You may be across different pages. So you may need to do two, two different translations. And they both may be misses inside your TLB. As a result, you need to handle two different misses. So this, these unaligned access actually cause a lot of trouble to the hardware designer, especially if you want to handle them at high performance. So some ISA say, don't use them, right? We're not going to support them, right? Uh, MIPS is an example. I think with very special cases, you can actually add uh, unaligned to MIPS. But x86, for example, it doesn't matter. You can actually use any address. Things can be unaligned. As a result, programmers are on, on, uh, don't, do not need to align their data. So this is a, another classic example of programmer microarchitecture trade-off. Programmer doesn't need to deal with aligning their data and the microarchitecture automatically handles unaligned accesses. That's good for the programmer, bad for the microarchitecture because it adds those complexity, uh, as I mentioned. So keep this in mind. We're not going to cover this. Uh, it's interesting, but people have solutions to this. Uh, okay, interleaving is another example. Mm. But you know the interleaving over here. That's a, another fundamental concept. That's basically banking. And we've already gone through the slide, I think, three times a semester. So you should know very well uh, what banking is. And this is another example. Uh, I think you can take a look at it. Basically, it, what, uh, it, an issue in interleaving always is how do you map data to different banks? You can think of this as alignment is also that way, right? It's really a data mapping issue. So we're going to talk a lot about data mapping. If your data is not mapped nicely, you get these unaligned accesses, right? That's true for bank conflicts also. If your data is not mapped nicely, you get these bank conflicts. And you don't want bank conflicts because they reduce your throughput and increase your latency, right? So in this case, for example, assume each bank supplies a word. Which banks do consecutive words in memory map to? Basically, how do we interleave the words across banks? Even, even in the simple case, you have this problem. And if your word 0 is here, word 1 is here, word 2 is here, basically then you're word interleaved. Right? And if you're word interleaved, but you're always accessing even words, then you have bank conflicts. So basically, this is always a matter of how, did, how is your data mapped and how you're accessing your data. And this is the answer to the previous question. Uh, basically, if you, you can use three interleaving schemes in this case. And you can take a look at that uh, on your own, I think. This is very basic. We cover this in digital circuits, actually. So uh, uh, this is one example. Uh, which byte in Word, actually? Uh, this, is, this is the bit that you may choose. If your physical address is this long, you may choose this bit uh, to decide which bank this address goes to. You may choose this bit, or you may choose some bit in between, right? In this case, you're really word interleaved. In this case, you're really interleaving half of your memory here. The first half is here, and the second half is here. In this case, it's somewhere in between, as you can see. And that has clear implications on uh, the performance and access patterns. Uh, and, and what kind of bank, bank conflict you get uh, based on the access patterns. OK, I think I've already said this earlier. Uh, this is the Cray-1 example with 16 banks. Uh, it had an 11-cycle bank latency. And consecutive words in memory were mapped to consecutive banks, which means that you could actually, actually start one access per cycle. And you could finish it one access, one access per cycle. Uh, in that case, you couldn't operate the banks fully in parallel because you couldn't start multiple access per cycle because banks actually share the address and data buses. So you could start one access every cycle, 
But you cannot start 16 accesses per cycle. Now, what does that require? Six, if you want to start 16 accesses per cycle, you really need to have 16 completely independent partitions. They're still called banks, but the, completely independent meaning means you cannot share address and data buses. So in main memory, usually you share address and data buses across banks. Your, so your banks are not completely independent of each other because of pin constraints. We talked about that, right? If you actually want to have 16 banks in your main memory, just like Cray 1 did, and if you want to be able to start accesses concurrently in all of them at the same time, which you could actually do if you have 16 loads in a vector instruction, for example, you could ensure that your data is mapped nicely such that they all, the loads actually generate addresses that happen to be in different banks. And the vector processors have that capability, just like modern GPUs, which are vector processors. Uh, they have that capability to start many accesses per cycle. But the problem is, if your memory is pin bottlenecked, what you need is you need an address bus, a command bus, and a data bus for every single bank. That's 16 times, I don't know, let's say, I'll say 50 pins. That's 800 pins over there. <laughs> Not good, right? <laughs> Whereas if you actually share it across banks, you'll have 50 pins. I just made up the number 50. Make sense? <laughs> so that's the problem. So this is actually one of the, uh, foreshadowing a little bit, this is one of the big benefits of some other memory technologies that can potentially be 3D stacked with the CPU. So if you have CPU, let's say, uh, in the logic layer that's generating these requests, and memory uh, is stacked on top of the CPU, so you don't need to go off chip, but you actually manufacture things in a 3D stacked manner, what might happen is actually you address the different partitions of memory uh, with uh, different command address and data buses, and these are all vertical connections. They're not really uh, interconnects that go off chip, so they're really across dies or across layers in this case. And there are technologies like through Silicon Vias that can enable you to do that. And there are some more emerging technologies that are coming up, in my opinion, that are even better. Uh, but that's the benefit of tightly integrating things such that they're, uh, they're really integrated together as opposed to me memory is here and CPU is here, and you have to go through a huge interconnect between them. Of course, the downside of these 3D technologies, which we will also talk about, is now things are very tightly integrated. There are multiple issues. Like one is, how do you ensure that you get the same capacities? Because you need many, many layers actually to put memory on top of that. But then the second issue is, how do you actually ensure that you deal with temperature and thermals, right? Because these things generate heat whenever you access them. And now heat has nowhere to escape, in a sense, if they're all integrated on top of it. OK. OK, I think I digressed a little bit, but this is literally a foreshadowing of what's going to come. This is a, this is a key question, basically, that could potentially be addressed by new technologies. But if you have a separate chip to access memory, it's very fundamental. You're pin limited as a result, multiple access per cycle. Your bandwidth is fundamentally also limited. That's why 3D stack technologies have fundamentally higher bandwidth. OK, so what is the cost of this? I think we've seen it earlier somewhere. Uh, OK, I, I think uh, this is also important. More, uh, this is another uh, example of integration, right? DRAM banks share buses for the reasons that we just talked. But L1 data caches or register files have multiple fully independent banks. Why? Because they're on the same chip and wires are cheap. They're not the off-chip interconnects. OK, so this is the bank abstraction. Uh, we've seen it. This, as I said, everything looks the same. And you have the chip enable, write enable, and I don't, I don't show the address here, but the address and data. And even this is an abstraction, it turns out. The, basically, you, you have the abstraction that you're getting 32 bits out of this. But uh, 32 bits can come from multiple chips, each of which can supply 32 divided by n bits. n is the number of chips. And that's the notion of a rank. That's how we get uh, wider data buses today. So if you look over here, you want 32 bits. right? But 32 bits require 32 pins. Uh, how do you ensure that you don't uh, need 32 pins uh, for data uh, in a DRAM chip? Well, design a DRAM chip that has only eight pins and put them side by side and ensure that they're operated as a rank. Why rank? It's like a rank of soldiers, right? You give them the same command, same address, and they give you different pieces of data, different responses, but uh, at the same time. So that's the idea of the rank. So the big, the big benefit is the chip doesn't have as many pins anymore, and you can collect these later. Right? 
Okay, basically it's a set of chips that respond to the same command and same address at the same time with different pieces of the requested data. I already said this over here. Producing an 8-bit per pin chip is cheaper than producing a 32-bit per, uh, per pin chip. And in this case, the DRAM manufacturers can produce an 8-bit per, uh, per pin chip, but uh, we can control and operate them in a rank such that we get 32 bits out of them. If you want to get 64 bits, what do you do? Basically, you put eight of them together. And that's essentially what you see in many systems today. Uh, okay, does that make sense? We're going to look at that uh, in a different way right now. Okay, let me talk about the DRAM uh, subsystem uh, from the bottom up. Uh, we're going to go top down later on. I think of this as this n-dimensional system. Basically, we start with rows, and, actually we start with a cell over here, and using cells you build the rows and columns. From that you build the bank, you build the chip, you build the rank, then channel, and then you attach it to uh, the uh, system. Right? Actually, we're going to skip some things over here. Actually, even a bank is composed of smaller substructures or called subarrays, but we're going to go back to that later. Uh, those subarrays are not currently exposed to the memory controllers, but there's no reason why, uh, why they should not be, uh, and we're going to look at some papers related to that. Okay, so in page mode DRAM, you may actually hear this. Uh, this is an unfortunate terminology, I think. People call page mode DRAM because a DRAM row is also referred to as a page. It's not nice because I think virtual page, uh, there's, a, there's a clear connection uh, between a page and a virtual memory, uh, but people somehow abuse the term over time. And you see, you have this, uh, if you see page mode, that means basically, uh, this means a row, essentially. A, bank, a DRAM bank is a 2D array of cells. You have rows and columns, as we discussed. A DRAM row is also called a DRAM page, and sense amplifiers are also called a row buffer, or page buffer, in some uh, places that you may read. Each address is really a row and column pair, uh, and when you're accessing a closed row, we've seen this earlier, you activate, you use an activate command to open the row, you place it into the row buffer, and then you can send a read and write command. Uh, and th those commands read or write a column in the row buffer. And then if you're done with the access, of course, these all have implications on latency. You activate and you need to wait for a while before you can read or write because uh, the thing that you activated, the row that you've activated, uh, that shares charge with the sense amplifiers and then you need to amplify the charge and you, you need to uh, be at a point where, uh, where the sense amplifiers are ready to be read. And this uh, leads to the delay between activate and a read and write. Right? So, and there's a specific timing parameter for that. We're going to cover this, uh, especially later in the lecture. And then once you read and write, you need to wait for a while such that the data comes back. And then at some point, uh, the array becomes ready to pre-charge, which means that once you're done with the read and write reliably, you can pre-charge the array such that it's prepared for the next access. What does pre-charge mean? Basically, uh, the row buffer gets closed and you actually ensure that the bit lines have the right, uh, uh, right level uh, such that the next row that you open can be sensed reliably. Okay, so that's a closed row access. Access to an open row, uh, no need for the activate command, but you knew that from before, right? And this is what a DRAM bank looks like, maybe somewhat internally. Uh, I've, I've shown this before. I, I put some numbers over here, as you can see. Uh, of course, as you scale the size of the technology, you, will, you would like to increase the size of the DRAM bank over here. So this is a row buffer, and this is the column address slash, row address slash. We've discussed this before. You can see that the address and command comes here. Okay, and I've shown this before, so I'm not going to show this again, but I'm going to play the animation, I guess. <laughs> So that's a, row hit ac uh, that's a row hit access, the second one, because you open the row. And the, sec the third one is also a row hit access because it's to an open row. And the last one is uh, a row conflict access, so that takes much longer. So you know this VRAM bank operation already, so I'm not going to go through this. So the DRAM chip consists of multiple of these banks. Eight is a common number, but it's actually 16, I think, in LPDDR, or it doesn't matter. It's very... It's a number right in the end. What's fundamental is there's a bank, uh, the concept of bank. Uh, people will, of course, try to increase that number, but increasing that number to arbitrary uh, values is also hard because, remember, these banks share the command, address, and data buses. And if you actually are sharing a very long interconnect across these large structures, you're fundamentally limited by the load that you put in those structures and how fast you can clock those, that interconnect depends on how many things that you load uh, that interconnect with. As a result, we don't see many, many banks in, within a DRAM chip, right? Uh, the chip itself, as, as we discussed, the narrow interface, uh, yeah, okay, not just the banks, but changing the number of banks, the size of the interface, the pins, 
whether or not the command address and data bus are shared or partitioned, they, these all have significant impact on DRAM system costs. Right? As a result, uh, we're at this trade-off point today. And this is exactly, this, this cost-driven system design is exactly one of the reasons the industry is doing a lot of business as usual today because they're very focused on the cost reduction. Maybe they're missing the bigger point in the entire system level. We have so much waste. Okay, we can talk about that, but keep this in mind because all of these design decisions affect your cost significantly. We talked about the interface, the number of pins. We just talked about the banks. Uh, increasing the banks actually leads to uh, reliability issues and that, they also increase your cost to also. So this is one example. I like this example. This is, I think, a micron uh, chip from a data sheet. Uh, basically, this shows what the internals look like, uh, at least at a logical level. But it's basically the same as what you discussed, right? Uh, you see you have these multiple banks. They share the address, addresses. Uh, you get the, uh, the decoder over here, row address slash and the decoder. And you have the memory array for each bank, send some flyers. And this is the column mux that we talk about, the column decoder and mux and all of that logic over here, the logic for which, through which you can write into the DRAM. You can see the write drivers over here and the logic through which you can read. Uh, this is an 8-bit chip. Uh, so you can actually read only eight uh, bits out of it. But as you can see, internally, it has this internal prefetch mechanism. Basically, whenever you request eight bits, it actually uh, gives you 32 over here inside the read latch. Now, what, what happens is uh, there's this burst mode in DRAM. Because it's, it's already fetched 32, in the next cycle, it can give you the next eight. In the next cycle, it can give you the next eight. In the next cycle, it can give you the next eight. So you can actually get four consecutive eight bits in a burst because of this internal prefetch mechanism. That's called burst mode DRAM. That's why it exists, because you can actually bring in 32 bits. You can make this larger, of course, and make your bursts longer. That way you can actually read things at a higher bandwidth. Now this is clearly better than uh, going through and uh, paying the penalty of reading uh, another eight bits through the row separately, right? If you get 32 bits out of the row very quickly and buffer them, such that if it's requested next in the burst, that's much faster than getting them separately. Questions? OK. OK, so there's what, what else is interesting here. There's a refresh counter, as you can see. There is an internal refresh counter that whenever it gets a refresh command, it keeps track of what to refresh next. And uh, in, many D, in many systems today, basically, the memory controller doesn't do the refresh itself. Uh, the refresh is uh, managed by the memory controller in the sense that the memory controller sends OK, refresh to the uh, DRAM, and the DRAM knows what to refresh at that point in time. And this, is, this was not the case before. In the past, the responsibility was more on the memory controller side. Memory controller actually uh, managed what, what to refresh. But at some point, the interface changed, uh, I believe in DDR2. And uh, once the interface changed, uh, the, the understanding was that memory controller is just responsible for sending a refresh command once a while, periodically. Uh, and the uh, memory is responsible for figuring out what to refresh internally. Now, of course, this gives more freedom to the memory to figure out what to refresh, uh, but it gives less freedom to the memory controller. So the memory controller cannot decide what needs to be refreshed when, right? Because it, it sends a refresh command, and it doesn't know what is being refreshed. It just needs to send the refresh command periodically. Now, we can even talk about whether this interface is reasonable or not. There are reasons for it, right? Uh, the upside of just sending the refresh command is you don't need to send an address every time, and that saves some energy. The downside is you lost control in the memory controller. Interesting, right? It's called a memory controller, but it's lost control over memory, uh, which means that you cannot really, uh, with this interface at least, you cannot really uh, uh, fix the refresh problem easily. OK. You might actually say, uh, why do we even send a command, right? That's good to question. Why does the memory controller even need to send a command? Any guesses? Yes? Because it needs to wait until the end of the refresh to send another read or write. Exactly, yes. Basically, basically, it's a synchronous interface, meaning that uh, you need to wait until something is done. It's not an asynchronous interface where you send a command and you get a response saying, oh, I'm done. Or in an asynchronous interface, for example, uh, you could, uh, basically you need to know everything, uh, how, how long a command takes in a synchronous interface. Whereas if this was an asynchronous interface, it would be based on more of a handshake-like protocol, uh, 
And if you send a read, and if the memory is refreshing, memory would say, sorry, I cannot service your read. Send again later on. That's more of an asynchronous interface, but we don't have that interface today. Today's interface is very synchronous. In order to be able to know what to send next, you need to know that the previous thing has ended. OK, so that's another design choice, right? Synchronous versus asynchronous interfaces. And the synchronous interface is actually one of the limiting parts uh, of the interface uh, currently. It makes things easier, perhaps, because now the memory controller is just going to wait for n number of cycles after sending a particular command, right? But it's not as flexible. We may actually need to move to more asynchronous interfaces going forward. Uh, especially if you want to put functions into this thing, right? Into this chip. You had something different or you had the same comment, uh, same comment, same response? Okay, great. Okay, so DRAM rank and module, basically, as I said, rank uh, is multiple chips operated together to form a wide interface. The main goal is to have the wide interface. As opposed to eight bits, you want 32 bits or 64 bits. All chips comprising a rank are controlled at the same time. It's like a rank of soldiers, right? And a DRAM module consists of one or more ranks, like a dual inline memory module, and this is what you plug in your motherboard. If we have chips with 8-bit interface to read 8 bytes in a single access, you use basically 8 chips uh, in a DIMM. Right. Okay, and this is what a rank looks like, basically. It's a 64-bit wide DIMM consisting of 8 chips. And usually if you have error-correcting codes, you usually have a ninth chip over here that has an error-correcting code that stores the error-correcting codes. And this is my pictorial view of it from one of, the, one of our papers. So what is the upside of DIMM? Uh, yeah, basically, that's, that's what it is. Uh, what's the upside? Basically, now you, have, you, you actually have two things, two benefits. The real reason that you do it is because you want to have a wide interface. But this also increases your capacity, right? And now you, it acts like a high-capacity DRAM chip with a wider interface. Uh, and also, from the memory controller's perspective, now it doesn't need to deal with individual chips, right? It's really controlling the stim, because uh, all of the chips are obeying the same uh, command. Now, there's a disadvantage over here, which is the granularity. Now, your accesses cannot be smaller than the interface width, right? It's not 8 bits anymore, it's 64 bits. If you actually want to widen it, it's 128 bits. So you may actually lose. If you, if you just want 8 bits, you always get 64 bits. And imagine the waste you have. We were talking about waste earlier. If you're really doing random accesses to really small pieces of data, you're bringing 64 bits, and waste starts from here. Uh, you, lo you wasted how, what fraction of it, right? 87.5%, 87 7 eighths of the interface, that important bandwidth, energy, and all of these. And if you go inside the chip, actually, the waste is, the waste is a bit higher, but the implications are lower because here you're really wasting uh, the full interconnect, right? You're going through the DRAM and memory, and that's 64 bits. If you need only 8 bits, you're exercising all of those 64. Internally also, if you need 8 bits, you're opening up an entire row, right? That's like 8 kilobytes, let's say. Well, that's a lot to open up. And if your accesses are truly random, you're really wasting a lot of energy and performance. And many, many workloads actually have a lot of random accesses also. So this is a real problem. This granularity mismatch to access granularity uh, is, is, is problematic because we're wasting a lot of bandwidth, latency, and energy because of that granularity mismatch. It's, it's good to think about granularities because this granularity is 64 bits because of the DIMM interface. This granularity is 8 kilobytes, let's say, the entire row. Because it's, uh, I, I, I say 8 kilobytes because this could actually be 1 kilobyte. The row could be uh, uh, 1 kilobyte. But if you have 8 chips, you're operating them at the same time, right? Concurrently, that's 8 kilobytes for you. Okay. So how do you actually get more capacity? People want the more capacity as well. And this is one way you, you get more capacity in a single channel. Basically, you have multiple DIMMs. I have this ugly picture, unfortunately, but it, it, it gets to the point across, I think. Uh, what do you do? You have a single controller, and you put multiple DIMMs, and you somehow interconnect them. Don't get hung up on the interconnect over here. Uh, I mean, a simple interconnect could be uh, a daisy chain, right? Which means that you have this DIMM, you connect to this DIMM, and then this DIMM connects to the next DIMM, and then this DIMM connects to the next DIMM, and this DIMM connects to the next DIMM, and that's it. In order to be able to access data that's mapped to this DIMM, you need to go through all of these hops. That's like a daisy chain. <laughs> and you need to have small controllers, of course, to redirect, or routers, if you will, uh, 
that redirect the request, that check, oh, is this request over here or not? Actually, that was, uh, uh, that was a dim standard that was proposed and heavily advocated uh, by some really big companies early on in the early 2000s it's called FBDIM, fully buffered DIM. Uh, it had buffers internally over here. Uh, I think they call these the advanced memory buffers, AMBs. But because it had that terrible interconnect, it never took off. People invested a lot and basically they said they backed off. They said, okay, that's not going to work. So that fully buffered them. If you search for it, you'll find information on it. Uh, because it had this daisy chain interconnect, the latency to access this thing was very high. So you had heterogeneous latencies clearly. This was fast, this was slower, this was slower, and this was the slowest. Now, your memory controller complexity was also high, and they designed these advanced memory buffers to simplify uh, some of the things. But th those advanced memory buffers on the DIMMs now started consuming more power. And as a result, this fully buffered DIMM died over time. So we don't have fully buffered DIMMs today. So this interconnect is important. Uh, uh, the disadvantage is if you want to actually have better latencies to all of these DIMMs, your interconnect complexity and energy consumption can become higher. And we're going to talk about interconnects. We're going to have separate lectures on interconnects, which is really, really important actually in system design. It's critical to know interconnects uh, if you want to design a full system. Uh, reg regardless of whatever level you're designing. You can be maybe designing on chip, you may be designing off chip, you may be designing a data center, interconnect is, is very important. Okay, so that's the disadvantage of multiple DIMMs. You need to be very careful with the interconnect. It buys you high capacity, that's great, but you need to be ca very careful with how you do the interconnect. Uh, and there is no magic, unfortunately. And scalability of your system, the capacity scalability is limited by this. And also latency scalability, right, as we just discussed. Okay, DRAM channels, you know about DRAM channels uh, very briefly. You, you can have different memory controllers controlling different DRAM channels, and internally you may have many, many DIMMs inside each channel, right? So that's one, way, one other way of scaling the system. And modern systems have multiple channels, clearly. Uh, and basically there are multiple choices here, right? You can have independent channels. This memory controller can be completely independent of this memory controller. Then you have really two memory controllers. Or you can have dependent channels, one memory controller with a wide interface. That's basically like a DIM, but you're going through different uh, channels right now. Okay, usually they're independent because you get the most flexibility and benefit uh, from, from the channels. Okay, and this is our generalized memory structure, basically. This is a two-channel system. Each channel has four DIMs, and each DIM has, in, in this case, a single rank, but it could be multiple ranks also. Uh, and each rank has a chip. As you can see, each chip has four banks here and each bank has columns and rows, and a cache line is mapped somewhere over there. So this is a five-dimensional structure of memory today. And this is another example. And this is one of the uh, readings that I recommended uh, that you do. Actually, it talks about subarrays also, but which we're not going to talk about right now. Uh, so each bank uh, is, consists of uh, multiple subarrays, but we, we don't expose these right now here. Okay, so these are some required readings. I hope you're doing them, because these, a lot of things will be simpler once you actually have read uh, these parts of these papers. Uh, and I think these are the clearest from my perspective. Of course, I, uh, these are my babies and my students' babies, so I have a biased perspective, right? But I think these are some of the clearest descriptions uh, of, of DRAM and how it operates, uh, uh, at least at the time they were written. Maybe we have some other papers that are more clear right now. Okay, so let's give the top down view. This was the bottom up view. Any questions on the bottom up view? Is this clear? Good. Okay. Let's do, do the top down view very quickly also because you can actually see this from top down. You can start with the channels basically. This is uh, one of the processors at its time. It has two channels. Maybe right now it has more channels. I don't know. Usually it does because it has many, many incarnations. Uh, and this is the DIM, as you can see, uh, dual inline memory modules. And this is the channel. It has two DIMs. Each channel has two DIMs. And if you look at a DIM, it looks like this in this case. This is the front of them and this is the back of them. Uh, and each of them is a different rank. It's a collection of eight chips in this case. And there's a serial presence detect circuitry, which we may talk about. You can store some information in it such that the memory controller recognizes what kind of DIM it is and what kind of chips it has such that it can configure itself uh, when you first see the DIM over there. Okay, and each rank looks like this. Basically, you have the address and command buses going to both. You have the chip selects. You have the, yeah, basically they share the data buses, as you can see. And if you break down a rank, a rank consists of multiple chips, each supplying different 8 bits. 
And if you break down the chip internally, focus on the chip, now it has eight banks over here. And if you look at a bank, we're not going to break it down in subways in this case, but the paper that I mentioned breaks it down in subways also, but it's basically the two-dimensional uh, structure that we saw before. And you get to the cell. Okay, let's talk about how to transfer a cache block over here. Uh, basically, this is your physical memory address space. Uh, your cache block gets mapped to a consecutive 64 bytes. Uh, and let's map it to somewhere over here. Basically, we're going to map it to a particular rank in this particular channel. Uh, because based on the address, you, some address bits specify which channel you go to, and some address bits specify which bank you go to. And usually, you don't map a cache block across different channels. You could, by, and that way you could actually reduce uh, the latency of the cache block potentially. Not necessarily, because with the burst mode, you could actually get the cache block very quickly also. Uh, usually you map uh, the cache block, uh, the, the granularity of interleaving between channels is at least a cache block in modern systems. Because now while you're accessing one cache block over here, you can access another cache block over here uh, in that channel. Uh, of course, the granularity can be larger also, and we're going to talk about that. It could be raw granularity. It could even be higher granularity. And some systems, it's configurable also. You could program it such that it's... Uh, row granularity versus cache line granularity. But let's assume we have uh, this cache line mapped to rank zero over here. Now, what does it look like? Basically, uh, this is uh, row zero, column zero. It gets mapped to uh, all of the chips. And you first get the first eight bytes of the cache block from these different chips. In the next burst, you get the next eight bytes. In the next burst, you get the next eight bytes. So you got the idea now, right? So if your burst length is eight, which is great, which is actually true for many uh, DRAMs today, uh, if you have this sort of organization, uh, you can get a full cache block that is worth 64 bytes in eight cycles. Eight, uh, eight IO cycles through the bus, of course, right? And uh, uh, during the process, you open a single row across these eight chips, and you go through that row, basically. And you uh, sequentially read eight columns. Makes sense, right? But this, I think, uh, clarifies exactly how things are mapped with this sort of mapping scheme. So there are many latency components to do this, of course. First of all, CPU needs to send the request to the controller. It takes some time. That's an on-chip time. You need to go through all of the caches, of course, and make sure that things are not there. Uh, there's controller latency. Things get queued and scheduled at the controller. Uh, that takes some time. Accesses are converted to the basic commands. And the controller, at some point, decides, OK, this is the time I'm going to service this request. Once it starts servicing the request, it breaks things down into basic commands. Maybe it, does it require an activate, does it require a pre-charge, does it require something else? And once it requires, once the controller figures out what it requires, it sends to DRAM that request. Uh, now that takes some time. And then the DRAM bank takes some time to respond. Uh, basically, if the row is already open, you just need to send the column command. This is also called a column address strobe. There's a lot of terminology here. So if you read data sheets, some of the data sheets talk about column address stroke. Basically, it's the, col it's the column address. It's the column command. Uh, it's a read or write, in this case, uh, accompanied with a column address. Uh, if, if the array is pre-charged, but there's no row is open, basically, it's the, if, the, if the array is not active, if the bank is not active, you need to send the row address. After that, you need to send the column address, clearly. In the worst case, you need to activate. Well, in the worst case, you need to pre-charge, activate, and then send the read or write command, right? We already covered this. But this takes a long, long amount of time. This is one of the dominant things. But this is also very important, the controller latency. And after that, DRAM takes some time to send uh, to the controller, bus latency. That's how long the burst takes, actually. And then the controller needs to send it back to the CPU, right? CPU or whatever agent is requesting it. So it's a really long latency. This is, that's one of, one of the more important points in the slide, perhaps. You start from the CPU, you go back to the CPU, and it takes a long time to do that. And it's, it's good to always keep in the back of your minds, why are we doing this? Especially if we are, we're doing some update to a location that we're not going to need at all in the CPU, right? If you think about that, this kind of makes no sense, right? <laughs> you just send the request and don't, don't go through all of this, maybe. Uh, and the memory handles it itself. And maybe the CPU doesn't need to control anything over here other than sending, OK, update this location for me. Some of it, of course, will be there, but maybe a lot of uh, the latency overhead can be uh, circumvented. 
Okay, we're going to talk about that, of course. Okay, let's talk about multiple banks a little bit. I think this is a clear concept right now, but it's important to get everyone on the same page. Multiple banks enable concurrent DRM accesses, and bits in the address determine which bank an address resides in, as we discussed. Multiple independent channels serve the same purpose, except they're even better, better in the sense of performance, because they have separate data buses, because they essentially increase the bus bandwidth that you have. But of course, they come at a higher cost, as we discussed. If you want to enable even more concurrency, you want to actually get rid of bank conflicts as well as channel conflicts. Conflicts at all levels, essentially. And you can start with the cache. You, could, you get rid of cache conflicts, as we, as we discussed when we talk about caches, right? And one of the key questions is, how do you select or randomize the bank and channel indices in, ad, in the address? Uh, and as we've discussed earlier, for caches, you can play the same tricks, right? You can do some hashing, for example. You take the address, you go through a hash function, and that tells you which bank the address is mapped to. And people use that, maybe not very randomizing part. Uh, actually, well, there's there a seminal paper that talks about this. It's Bob Rao's pseudo-randomly interleaved memory. It's from ISCA 1990. That actually looks at really interesting hash functions using Galois fields and matrix uh, computations. Uh, and, uh, and actually uh, tries to interleave memory pseudo-randomly such that uh, the bank conflicts are reduced. And his motivation was actually, a lot of these ideas uh, started out with high memory bandwidth demand, high concurrency. And you can imagine where that is most felt, right? The processors that most felt it at, the, at that point in time, in the 1980s, 1990s, were actually SIMD processors, single instruction, multiple data. Uh, vector processors or array processors, because they could generate many, many requests, but they they wanted very high memory bandwidth, but these conflicts really hurt them significantly. Uh, so they wanted to actually have, uh, get rid of these conflicts. And Bob Rao's paper in ISCA 1990 is one example that tries to do that for a vector processor. But the ideas are applicable to existing systems also. Uh, I mean, I was going to say, in those vector processors, some of the regular memory access patterns actually cause conflicts also. Like if you have 16 banks, and if your stride is 16 cache blocks, let's say, you're back to having one bank, right? Because you're, you're always accessing bank zero, if that's the case. If you're doing the mapping uh, in, a, in a way such that those accesses actually go to zero. So if you randomize the mapping, then you can actually get rid of a lot of, that, a lot of those conflicts. OK, so uh, well, this is, how, this is what happens if you actually have a single bank. You need to wait for the DRM access before you start the next access, because they all go to the si single bank. This is the example of bank conflicts. But if you have multiple banks, at least in DRAM today, you cannot start the accesses concurrently, but you can start the access in a pipeline manner. Once you start the first access to bank zero, you can start the next access to bank one, next access to bank two, dot, dot, dot. <coughs> of course, channels are even better than that, that you can start things concurrently in different channels. So interleaving, uh, again, I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can study it by yourself. I, we, I said that cache block interleaving is heavily used today. Basically, consecutive cache block goes to a consecutive uh, banks and consecutive channels. I don't have the channels over here. Uh, you could actually have row interleaving. Consecutive rows of memory can go to consecutive banks. Uh, and you can go through the exercise uh, of uh, where things are mapped over here. OK. Today, actually, people use this bank mapping randomization a little bit in memory controllers. Maybe not to the extent of the, what this paper oh, it says 1991. I think 1991 is the right answer. I had a bit flip. <laughs> In, in the last digit over here. Uh, basically, today, many memory controllers use some sort of randomization because they recognize that this is a problem. They want to help with the uh, uh, bank conflict reduction. So one example is this. And people have reverse engineered what Intel memory controllers do, for example. You can find online uh, programs as well as papers that reverse engineered what this mapping function is from the address, physical address, to uh, the bank index. Uh, and this is one example. Basically, here you're indexing some number of bits with some higher, level, higher number of bits to, get, uh, to randomize things a little bit. Maybe it's not as fancy as this one. But if you're interested in this, I would recommend that you take a look at this very fundamental paper. Uh, OK. Uh, so address mapping is actually a not easy problem. It's a very tough problem uh, because there are many dimensions to it. As I said, there's a five-dimensional structure, right? And we want to actually enable more dimensions. Like we want to enable subarrays below the banks that will add even more dimensions. Uh, then the key question is, how do you do that? 
Where do the channel bits come from? Where do the bank bits come from? Is it programmable? This is not programmable, clearly. Right? You decide on one address mapping, and it's fixed. What if you get bank conflicts despite everything you do? What do you do? Well, you need to migrate the pages in that case, right? But that's a huge, very heavy operation, migrating the pages. Now you need to shoot down the TLB, meaning that you need to change the mapping that you already have in the page table to something else, because that's how you migrate a page, because you really need to inform the operating system to be able to do that, right? You cannot easily move a page from here to here without informing the operating system in existing systems, because somebody needs to do the translation, right? So it's good to think about that. Uh, today, it's very hard to migrate pages uh, because of the overheads of that page migration. So you need to come up with, but, th but then when you're designing the hardware, you need to come up with uh, some sort of mapping that looks like this. Uh, how do you do it? <laughs> not easy. So this is a very actually interesting research area for sure, but it's not an easy research area. People have looked at programmable mapping mechanisms, but there needs to be more done in that area. Today, in existing systems, operating system has control, some control, in, at least indirect control, uh, where an address can map to in DRAM. That's why, uh, uh, wh wh why, because this is the virtual address for a given address that you're trying to access. This gets converted to a physical address by the operating system, so the page table is over here, clearly. Now, the, this physical address gets interpreted in hardware as uh, to where that physical address resides, right? So if your mapping scheme is like this, this physical address resides in this bank uh, that corresponds to these bits in the physical frame number. And operating system clearly has control on deciding those bits, right? For example, if the operating system wants to allocate uh, this particular address to a particular bank, it can, assuming that it knows that these bits are actually mapped to the banks. It can basically pick physical frame numbers that have a particular color or particular value. This is also called a color, uh, such that this virtual page number uh, that belongs to that address gets mapped to that physical frame number. That's the idea, basically. Operating system can influence which bank, channel, and rank a virtual page is mapped to. Operating system, what operating system cannot influence is any bits that change over here, right? It can influence everything over here. It can color the pages. So what it can do, uh, this is called page coloring, it can color the pages to minimize bank conflicts if it has some idea of when they're happening or when they might happen. It can color the pages such that different uh, applications can actually get mapped to different banks, for example, or different channels. Whenever you're allocating a physical frame, you pick it from, uh, for this application, you pick it from channel zero. For this other application, you pick it from channel one. Right. Or, or you, could do, you could do other things, minimize latency in the network. So you can actually take a look at some of these papers that are referenced over here. But it has a very limited form of control uh, right now, as you can see. It's not as direct. And some parts are not even controlled. So if you're, if you're for example, selecting your channel bits over here, meaning that if you're doing channel uh, cache block interleaving uh, across the channels or across the banks, then the operating system has no control to fix that, right? because you've selected a bit that the operating system cannot control. And actually, many systems do that. Uh, I bet most systems actually are doing channel interleaving, because that's trying to maximize the bandwidth. It's not necessarily good, though. OK, so there's a lot of interesting ideas that could be explored in this area. How do you do this mapping? Uh, we'll see. And this is one paper that I referenced over here. Uh, you can take a look. And this is another one, that if you're interested. OK, as I said, uh, there is more on reducing bank conflicts. Bank conflicts actually have bothered people. They still bother people a lot. They bother me a lot. <laughs> Why do we have these conflicts? But this paper that I uh, actually is, a, is one of the required readings for DRAM talks about another level inside the bank. As I said earlier, we didn't go into this level so far. Even bank itself is a logical abstraction. So if you look at the bank, uh, let's say the, uh, you have a row, and you have 32,000 rows. And it turns out this 32,000 is a huge number. If you had 32,000, and if you wanted to sense across that huge interconnect what the value of a particular bit is, it would be very difficult because, first of all, it would be very high latency to go through that interconnect, and your sensing circuit needs to be even more reliable. What manufacturers, what DRAM designers, or any kind of memory designers do is they chop up memory into smaller pieces. These are called subarrays. 
in this case, as you can see, a subarray is 512 rows. And what you do is you activate a row inside the subarray and that gets sensed locally. So you don't have a single row buffer that's shared by 32,000 rows. Instead, you have these local row buffers that are shared by 512 rows and you have these 64 different subarrays. Why? Because this is too slow. That interconnect is too long. Now this interconnect is very short. You can make it nice. And, but now the trade-off is area, right? Now you have many of these local row buffers, your sense amplifiers, but hopefully they're smaller than what you would otherwise build because this is not easy to build if you have so many uh, things hanging on that bit line. Uh, so the trade-off is clearly latency versus area. You have more area because you have many, many of these local row buffers, but your latency is much shorter. That's good. Now, uh, internally, externally, to the memory controller, this is the abstraction because memory controller is not aware of these subarrays. Memory control actually doesn't control these subarrays. Uh, what it does is it controls, it sends an access to the bank, and it uh, ensures that two things do not access the bank at the same time, two requests do not access the bank at the same time. But if you know this internal structure, now you can say, oh, maybe I can reduce the bank conflicts by making these subarrays a little bit more independent from each other. And that's the idea of this paper. If you actually know what the structure internally looks like, you could ensure that this subarray can be accessed in a pipeline manner with this subarray. So you start an access to this subarray. If the next access goes to the next subarray, you pipeline that access. Well, of course, this doesn't happen in existing DRAM chips. You need to change the structure a little bit such that you need to have different latches for these different subarrays. Today, there's only a single latch across all of the subarrays, so you can actually have only one row active in any subarray in a bank. Even though you have actually 64 local row buffers, today we're using only one. We need to have lo local row buffers so that, such that our latency is low, but we're really wasting all of these row buffers. We're using only one because we have a single latch controlling it, and that's a conscious design choice. So if you actually have smaller latches over here, you can control these subarrays somewhat independently, start accesses in a pipeline manner, and you can activate multiple rows at the same time in a single DRAM bank. And that's the idea of this paper, subarray level parallelism. Uh, and actually the, the four page paper that I keep recommending to you, the Intel and Samsung paper, uh, picked up on this and they evaluate this idea uh, and they show benefits in their own internal infrastructure, saying that, oh, this is a good idea that we should implement in future systems because this could enable to us to tolerate many latencies. Why does it enable toleration of latencies? Because if you have a bank conflict, you don't, the two requests now can be pipelined across the subarrays, right, as opposed to the second request waiting for the first request. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll go, get back to the global robo a little bit later. Uh, but this global robo fair is really the I.O. drivers. So this needs to be long. There's no, basically, how do you get the data from this local robo fair out outside the chip? Well, then you actually need to have very long interconnects. So you actually don't move. So if you look at the granularity over here, it's about, let's say, 2,000 bits. 2K bits. You don't move 2K bits across the entire chip, you move 8 bits or 32 bits, right? That's what this global row buffer means. This is really the I.O. circuitry outside. There are papers that actually show this much better, which I can show later. But you need very wide and powerful interconnects uh, to, to take the data from here all the way to that I.O. circuitry outside. But the first step is sensing, and then you, you, latch, uh, you, you, move that, uh, you move the bits that you want, you move the column that you want to those global bit lines, which are not shown here, actually. The global bit lines are not shown here. Okay, so I'd recommend this paper. Uh, we may cover it later on. Any questions? So hopefully this gives you an example. I kind of lied to you, right, with the bank interface. That's what the memory controller sees, but internally you, you can actually have a lot of freedom. And if you actually know exactly how things are designed internally, you could do even more. The good thing is today there's a lot of opportunity in this area because people are looking at it. It's surprising that people have not looked at it for a long time, right? Because the design mentality was not really, oh, let's do something here to make things better. The design mentality is, oh, let's improve the processor. But maybe, the pro maybe we're focusing at the wrong place. We're looking at for our keys. If, you, if you've lost your keys, uh, 
you shouldn't be looking for the keys in an area that is already very well written, you know, right? Okay. Okay, refresh, we talked about this a lot. I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but clearly this is a problem with the DRAM technology. It has implications on performance because every n milliseconds you need to activate and precharge each row. Well, somebody needs to activate and precharge. Maybe not the memory controller, that, as it says in, in slide. <coughs> memory controller see, needs to send a command, and internally the DRAM maybe refreshes and uh, activates and precharges some number of rows. Typical end today is 64 milliseconds, and we, we saw that this may not be a good idea because most cells can actually retain data for much longer. So clearly, this has implications on performance also. The bank is unavailable, so this causes con conflicts also. So refresh causes conflicts with accesses, and uh, I'll point you to a paper that talks about that problem also. It could cause long pause times. If we refresh all rows in burst, every 64 milliseconds, the DRAM will be unavailable until the refresh cycle ends, which is not a good idea, and people have figured out that distributed refresh is much better than burst refresh. As opposed to doing this burst refresh, all rows are refreshed immediately one after another. You basically periodically do some number of rows. Each row is refreshed at a different time at regular intervals. And this is a nice picture from one of Micron's data sheets. Basically, this is burst refresh. You do a lot of refreshes. Basically, you do nothing else, essentially, <laughs> to the memory at that point in time. And then you have some amount of time where you can do a lot of things because you don't do any refresh. And then you ensure that these refreshes happen within the required time to complete refreshes of all rows, and then you start refreshing again. And here you can see that you have very long pause times until the memory gets refreshed. But today, uh, most reasonable controllers use distributed refresh. If they're not using that, uh, that's a shame, I think, uh, because it eliminates long pause times, right? You, could, this, you can much more easily deal uh, with this uh, as opposed to this. And how else can we reduce the refresh, effect of refresh on performance? We've actually covered this with Raider, right? Can we re reduce the number of refreshes? Uh, and we already said that. OK, I'm, we already have, have this slide, so I'm going to skip that. But this is one way of reducing the refreshes. And we've covered some of this also, uh, the challenges of uh, retention time profiling. And I think I showed you the slide as well. So I'm going to skip some of these. OK, there are many other ways of potentially reducing refresh, actually. Uh, if you can get rid of refresh somehow, that'd be great in DRAM. It's not clear if it'll ever happen. But getting rid of as much as possible is good for many, many reasons, right? As you know on the slide. For scaling the circuitry also, uh, as you can see. But there are other issues with the refresh which are interesting, like this. Uh, uh, as I said, refreshes cause conflicts to accesses. And how do you eliminate them? This goes into better scheduling also. But this also goes to... Uh, Mm, like uh, uh, better taking advantage of the internal structure. For example, if, you're, if you have a bank, if you're refreshing one subarray of the bank, there's no reason you cannot access the other subarray. Right? And this paper actually, uh, this is one of the ideas in this paper. This is a collection of ideas in terms of how do you reduce the performance impact of DRAM refresh. And the key idea, key high level idea is you want to parallelize refreshes with accesses. While you're doing refresh, if you can access the other subarray, just do it. Right? And it's actually relatively low cost. And that's, that's one of the ideas over here. There's a lot more to do in this. This doesn't get rid of a refresh itself, but this gets rid of some, a lot of the performance impact of the refresh. OK, maybe that's a good place to actually take a five minute break. I see people wearing out a little bit. <laughs> Let's take a five minute break. Let's be back at 1348. And we'll start with memory controls a little bit more. OK, shall we get started? Okay, let's do it. Uh, so now that we've covered uh, a lot of the basic, I'm going to basics. I'm going to jump into memory controllers a little bit more. Although we've been talking about memory controllers a lot, we want to talk more about them because they're so important. As I said, in this in this example, everything goes through the memory controller, even the I/O requests. Right? You want to fill something from the disk from memory that goes through the memory controller. We're actually going to talk about that. Uh, later on when we cover some ideas in, in reducing the performance impact of I.O. accesses. So this is really, the, in my opinion, memory control is really center of this thing. It's really at the center. Everybody needs to access, uh, go through that memory controller. So we really need to pay more attention to that controller. And maybe that needs to be more center, uh, more at the center of things as opposed to some other computation units, right? Uh, 
Okay, I'm going to talk about DRAM since we've been focusing on DRAM, but it's good to keep in mind that long latency memories have similar characteristics that need to be controlled. They all have their idiosyncrasies. Uh, and it's not just about timing. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, the following discussion as, as, uh, with DRAM as an example. But many scheduling and control issues are similar in the design of controllers for other types of memories. Flash memory, there's actually a lot of work in this area, a lot of knowns and a lot of unknowns also. If you go to a flash memory company, actually, you'd go and design flash controllers. Uh, it's a lot of fun, I think. There are a lot of things that you need to juggle with. But uh, there's not a lot of public knowledge, as, uh, except for some papers that I'm going to mention about these. Uh, other emerging memory technologies, phase change memory, spin transfer torque magnetic memory, RAM, uh, MRAM, dot, dot, dot. They all have uh, characteristics, certainly latency uh, to be controlled, but also wear out, for example. If a cell wears out, how do you deal with it? How do you ensure that you don't try to read from a cell that's already worn out and you don't get into that situation, right? And these other technologies can place other demands on the controller, just like what I described, right? Flash memory. So this is an example. Uh, flash memory, actually, you have a full controller, like a processor, inside there. These are similar to the DRAM controllers, except they're flash memory specific. And they do much more, like a lot of error correction, as you can see, ECC engines, uh, some buffer management, some, yeah, a lot of other things. In the flash translation layer, they do remapping of requests so that they can manage the wear out. So flash, for example, is a technology that wears out very quickly. Depending on how many bits per cell you store, your wear out, uh, basically, you can do 3,000 writes to a cell in MLC, uh, multi-level cell flash memory that can store two bits per cell. And after that, it's dead. Actually, manufacturers guarantee only 3,000 writes per cell. Which means that if you're very uneven in your writes to different pages in flash, then you could actually wear out some pages much earlier than others, and you may not be very nicely utilizing your flash. So uh, flash uh, translation layer does a lot of remapping and wear out management in addition to of error correction that we may talk about if we get to it. But they also do garbage collection, which means that some pages, Flash has a very interesting architecture. Uh, mm, basically, in order to be able to uh, write to a page, uh, you need to be able to, uh, you, need, you should erase the entire block first. Now, of course, it's a conscious design choice that's made so that you minimize the uh, overheads. Uh, but this means that uh, you cannot write to a location before erasing it. And as a result, uh, you need to figure out what you should erase. But you cannot erase everything easily because they may have some valid pages internally. So a page granularity is much smaller than the erase granularity. A page is like 8 kilobytes, and the erase could be 128 or 256 kilobytes, which means that a, a, a block can have many pages. And some of them may be valid, and some of them may be invalid. Right? That's the idea. But if you want to write a location, uh, you cannot just write over there. You need to remap it somewhere else, and which means that, that creates uh, these uh, parts in Flash uh, where some blocks have some valid pages, some other blocks don't have a lot of valid pages. So you need to do this garbage collection to maximize uh, the storage space that you're managing. So that's the idea of garbage collection. Some blocks have, so for example, if you have a block that has only one valid page, that's not garbage yet <laughs> because you have one valid page, but it may make sense to move that somewhere else so that you can actually uh, do something to that entire page, right? Okay, there are a lot of ideas over here that I'm not going to go through because there are a lot of trade-offs also. But if you're really interested in it, uh, you should first start with this paper, I would say, because this is the uh, only paper that I know of that goes into a lot of detail on uh, how a flash controller uh, works and mitigates, especially from an error, error correction perspective. But it goes through the system architecture of uh, these components, at least to some level of detail over here. OK, I'm not going to go through this in detail. But this is actually a much more complex controller, I should say that. The upside in Flash is uh, the latencies are very long, so your decisions don't need to be made as fast. Right? You can actually make decisions somewhat slowly, and it's OK because you're going to wait for the memory for a while anyway. Whereas in DRAM, your decisions need to be made very, very fast. Uh, as a result, you cannot put a lot of complexity into the controller, perhaps. Uh, We'll see. Or maybe you need to design the controller in a much more intelligent way to add more complexity into it. OK, there are some other works uh, that look at modern SSD controls. If you're interested, you can take a look at them also. Uh, but we may go get back to that. But let's go back to DRAM. DRAM is actually very interesting uh, in itself, because DRAM is also proliferating into uh, different types. 
There are many different types with different interfaces optimized for different purposes. Like commodity DRAM has DDR. Uh, DDR5 will be coming up sometime maybe. Low power DRAM, LP, DDR, low power DDR. And uh, there are new versions of it coming up. High bandwidth DRAM for graphics, because graphics engines demand high bandwidth, just like the SIMD engines. GPUs are actually modern SIMD engines, vector processors or A processors. As a result, they demanded very high bandwidth, so they had the specialized GDDR interface, which had high bandwidth and high latency. Uh, so it was designed for that purpose. And low latency, reduced latency DRAM or embedded, lat embedded DRAM, these are much higher cost also, because they get low latency. Uh, and 3D stack DRAM, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is uh, happening more and more. No, modern GPUs actually have high bandwidth memory. That's a 3D stack DRAM, even though they don't necessarily use it. In a 3D stack fashion, they have an interposer to connect the GPU to the memory currently. But there's no reason you cannot actually have really 3D stacked, except for cost, power, and reliability, <laughs> which are important reasons. Uh, and uh, hybrid memory, we're, we're going to talk about that. So clearly there's a proliferation of DRAM also, and these require different controllers actually. So one key question is, under, underlying, but the key thing is underlying microarchitecture is fundamentally the same. Basically the bank is still a bank, and they all look very similar internally. It's just the interface that's different. And we may talk about those interfaces. So a flexible memory controller can support various DRAM types. Ideally you would have a memory controller chip that supports all of these. Now you can plug and play different memory memories, but that's not the case in existing systems because these have very different interfaces to deal with. And one of the most difficult parts actually is the analog interface to all of these different ones. Yes, you can design the logic perhaps to deal with all of the idiosyncrasies these have, but the analog interface takes much, much longer to design. This is called the phi or the physical layer. Uh, if you remember the multi-core system picture that I showed you earlier, there was a huge I.O. interface going to the memory, right? Most of that is occupied by the analog interface. And the analog interface is, unfortunately, <laughs> very different in, from, uh, between these different DRAM types. Like high bandwidth memory has a very different analog interface compared to DDR. So if you want to have both of them pluggable to your system, now you need to have both of them. So this complicates the memory controller as well as the need for that analog interface multiple different times. So it's difficult to support old types as well as upgrades, right? If you, for example, designed your chip for an old memory technology and after your chip came into the market and the new technology came, maybe that's not good, right? <laughs> because your, your memory controller cannot adapt to that new technology and you may not be able to take advantage of that new technology. Okay, so DRAM types this is an example from a paper that we're going to cover when we get to simulation, if we get to it today. Uh, this was uh, in 2015, these were some of the interfaces uh, and the different DRAM types at that time. There are a bunch of academic proposals, some of which we're going to cover. Of course, these also somewhat, some of them change the interface, some of which you know later. Uh, but also there are a bunch of 3D stacked, yeah, high performance. You can see this over here. And this is a paper that you should definitely take a look at later on. So what does the DRAM controller need to do? The first and foremost, it needs to ensure correct operation, right? Refresh and timing. Uh, second, it needs to service DRM requests while obeying the timing constraints while doing the first. And there are many timing constraints, uh, resource conflicts, bank, bus, channel, minimum read to write delays. So it needs to translate requests to DRM command sequences that obey these timing constraints. And it needs to buffer and schedule requests for high performance and quality of service. So there's a correctness implication of these timing constraints and there's a performance implication as well. Uh, so reordering, helps performance as we discussed, right? Uh, uh, taking advantage of the row buffer, reducing bank conflicts, rank conflicts, managing the bus so that you don't, you don't underutilize the bus, assuming if you need it, and you usually need it. And on top of this, there's a the power aspect, managing the power consumption and thermals in DRAM. Uh, turning on and off the DRAM chips, managing power modes, depending on the granularity of this. Today, we are at a very coarse grain, a coarse granularity, but going forward, we may actually need more finer granularity. I don't put some of the other things here, reliability management, for example, error correction. The memory controller needs to error correction if you have ECC. Uh, and uh, voltage, voltage and frequency scaling. I think that's, again, these are some of the proposals uh, uh, that we may cover at some point. So a modern, modern DRAM control looks like this. Again, this is an oversimplification over here. This is looking more at the, uh, this is the signaling interface, as I said, the analog interface over here. Uh, and uh, you need to do command scheduling and you, some scheduling over here. Anyway, there are a bunch of pictures. This is a picture from one of the papers that we have written. 
essentially you have different design choices. You can actually partition the memory request buffer across the banks. That enables, of course, uh, faster access to the request buffers. But of course, it has the downsides of partitioning now. If you have eight requests per, eight, uh, eight buffers per bank, uh, if you have B banks, you'll have eight B buffers, right, in this case. Uh, but if your accesses are always to the same bank, then you, you're, not, you're underutilizing that space. So that's the classic trade-off between partitioning and sharing. But this is, this, this is what a modern memory control looks like usually. Uh, there are different bank schedulers. Each bank scheduler selects a request, and then there is a more global scheduler that arbitrates between the bank schedulers. Uh, okay. And we've already seen some of these scheduling policies, and I'm not going to go through them uh, right now, but first come, first serve, row hit first serve, uh, first. But actually, scheduling is done at the command level, meaning there's a request that's coming. Request, the CPU is requesting a read or write to this address, right? Or from this address and with this data. Uh, but that request needs to be broken down into commands uh, at the lower level. So it's, this is actually not fully correct. Scheduling can be done at the command level as well as the request level, but you need to do some scheduling at the command level for sure. You can reorder the requests first and then generate the commands and then do some scheduling over the commands also after that. So there are multiple levels. And th this is interesting to think about. If, you're, if you've never thought about it, uh, these are different levels because commands are different. Commands actually are uh, at the level of the physical DRAM chip, right? Because you know exactly what you need to do at that point. You need to read or write or activate or pre-charge. And now you need to schedule refreshes in as well, right? Whereas requests, you just have the addresses uh, over there. And if you're actually doing FRFCFS, uh, within each group of commands, you have the column commands and you have the row commands. You prioritize the column commands over the row commands. And within each group, older commands are prioritized over younger commands. Uh, yeah, that's how it is. And it's very easy once you do that, right? It's basically a priority level for each command. Okay, I'm going to skip this as you know already this very well. But this is very fundamental. That's why this slide keeps appearing. And I put a lot of effort into doing it, so it's good to <laughs> replicate it. Okay, uh, so a scheduling policy, as I just said, is a request or command prioritization order. Prioritization can be based on many things. Request age, row buffer hit miss status, of course, those are the things that we discussed. But it could be also request type, prefetch, read, write. We discussed this briefly last time. How do you reorder these? Request store type, like is the load miss, is the store miss? Request criticality, how do you define criticality? Is it the request that's stalling the core at this point? Is it the oldest one? Maybe the oldest one is not critical, but it could be critical also. How, many, uh, how, how much does it cost, as we've discussed earlier, right? How many instructions in the core are dependent on it? Maybe that's important. Will it stall the processor? It could be based on interference that's caused to other cores. Maybe if you get rid of this request quickly, it's not going to cause interference to many cores, right? I don't know. Uh, so there are many, many things here. So this is not an easy task, actually, especially if you have many cores, many different agents, and many different types of memories underneath. Uh, yeah, sharing. So we'll, we'll talk about this, we'll get back to this. Uh, and there are many, many ideas that are needed over here. One of the things is row buffer management policies. I think you know this very well. If you have, uh, you could actually have management policies over here, but you could keep the row open after an access. That's called the open row policy. Now this is good if the next access to the, is to the same row. That leads to a row hit, but if the next access to, is to a different row, that's a problem because that leads to row conflict and it wastes energy. Closed row, the exact opposite, but this is not fully the opposite because the reasonable way of implementing this is you close the row after an access if no requests are already in the request buffer uh, that need the same row. Of course, you could do really pure closed row. Actually, DRAM uh, provides uh, a very fast uh, mechanism to uh, pre charge the array after. Uh, you're done with an access, right? Uh, you could actually combine a read command with a pre-charge command so that you don't need to send two commands to read and then pre-charge next. Uh, if you do that, you can actually close the row after you read it. But you can also, of course, close the row after every read also, but this makes maybe not so much sense if the row is needed by some other request. That's why I have this. Uh, if no other requests uh, are already in the request buffer, uh, and they need the same row over here. So the upside is next access might need a different row. You avoid a row conflict, but the next access might need the same row. You, you have an extra activate latency. That's not good. So the best policy is not fixed. The best policy is more adaptive, as you might have imagined. Uh, you predict whether or not the next access to the bank will be to the same row and act accordingly. So, uh, and many modern processors actually employ some sort of prediction mechanism. Uh, 
which may or may not be interesting. Uh, there's another trade-off here that I didn't really talk about, which is the power trade-off. If you keep a row open for a really long time, you're consuming power. Because what, what it means to keep a row open, you, basically the row buffer is active. You're continuously uh, uh, sensing and amplifying the data. Of course, not as the first time, but you basically uh, you have this feedback loop between the cell and the row buffer. As a result, you're wasting dynamic power. Turning off the row buffer, pre-charging the bank is good for power. Uh, so, so actually many memory controllers have these policies where after some time you close the row. It's a hard cut, but uh, that saves power. Yeah. So aggressive power management by managing the row buffer or keeping it less active is also important. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Basically, this kind of simulates what happens with the different policies. If your first axis is this and your next axis is this, what are the commands that are needed? It's like a table that does a simulation for you for two requests. It's very intuitive. So let's talk about power management a little bit more, uh, not too much more. Uh, DRAM chips have power modes. Uh, and the idea is very simple. When you don't access a chip, power it down. Or you go to a lower power mode somehow. And these are some of the states in many chips. Uh, it's not a lot, as you can see. You can be active, which is the highest power. Everything is active. Uh, you're accessing the chip. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and there's, there should be an accessing part also. Access power actually is the highest. But active means you're not accessing it, but every, all of the circuitry is active, including the uh, row, uh, row buffer. The sense amplifiers actually have an active uh, row inside them. Uh, the, this one is all banks are idle. Uh, this one is your power down, basically a power down you can read the different specifications. I'm not going to go into the detail of this because specifications also change. But basically, this is the lowest power state where all of the row buffers are closed uh, and uh, you're basically saving some power. But you can still access the chip and you can get out of this mode relatively fast. Self-refresh is, of course, uh, this is almost the minimum power currently you can get. Uh, basically, what this means is all of the circuitry is turned off except for the refresh circuitry assuming you believe the specification. So you're wasting some power to keep the refresh circuitry on, and DRAM is doing that refresh uh, by itself, which means that it doesn't require a command coming from the memory controller. So this is the lowest power you can get today. Uh, and it's actually a very low power, but it's still high enough power that this is wasting time refreshing. Uh, and of course, there are implications of this. Uh, Maybe you, if, if you can always stay in the self-refresh state, that's good. But the downside is if you're in the self-refresh state, and if you need access to DRAM, it takes a long time to power up the circuitry that you need to do the access, to, to go to the active state, for example. OK, so basically, how do you actually manage this is really interesting. And this is not even the finest grain uh, type of management, right? This is actually looking at all banks. So you could actually manage the all, different banks separately, but that interface is not exposed today to the system. And this is not also talking about voltage and frequency scaling into DRAM, which I think is, a, uh, is an idea that makes sense. But that's another dimension of power management. OK, so hopefully this gave you an idea of what a memory controller does. Uh, it's, it's really a lot. As a result, it's not easy to design these controllers. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, Chuck Tacker. I don't know. If, does anybody know the name Chuck Tacker? OK, he's a Turing Award winner. I think in 2009 or so. Basically, he was uh, the designer of many systems, uh, including the Alto system. That was one of the earliest personal computers, actually, in the 1970s, 80s. Uh, he designed all of these systems. And he was building a DDR3 memory controller for, uh, for one of the boards that were being developed at Microsoft. Uh, uh, and uh, he was mentioning DRAM controllers are one of the worst things he's designed in his life. <laughs> And that is true, because you need to deal with all of these really hairy issues. Compared to a DRAM controller, I think other logic is relatively easy. Now, you'll experience some of this in simulation in one of your labs, but it's going to be a higher level. It's not going to be RTL. Yeah. OK, so difficulty of DRAM control. Let's talk about the difficulty uh, a little bit. Uh, well, it's hopefully it's clear, but uh, there's more. Basically, you need to obey the DRAM timing constraints for correctness. What does this entail? Well, there are many timing constraints. The interface is not nice, basically. The interface, if, 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 so if you think about an asynchronous interface, you would say read or write and may, maybe refresh and get a response back sometime, right? But today, we've gone into this interface where we have very fine-grained constraints in timing because it's a synchronous interface, and we want to make the best out of it. 
there are more than 50, actually more than 100 timing constraints in DRAM. Some of them matter a lot more. Like uh, t write to read, there's a minimum number of cycles that the memory controller needs to wait before issuing a read command after a write command is issued. Uh, and this is actually across the entire rank. So it's a rank level constraint. Why? Because when you're writing to the entire rank, you're driving the bus in one way, and if you want to read from it, you need to change that direction. If you think about it at the higher level, at an abstraction level, that's what needs to happen. And it takes time to change that direction. There's also a read to write constraint, which is not explicitly specified, but you can uh, infer it. Uh, TRC, this is actually one, a very important constraint. This is the minimum number of cycles between the issuing of two consecutive activate commands to the same bank. This is called row cycling. And usually people look at DRAM latency with this TRC constraint. But there are many others, like how long it takes to acti from activate to a read. Right? As we said, the circuit needs to stabilize, so you need to wait for that. Uh, so this is important, and people have come up with these timing constraints because they didn't want to, set, they didn't want to uh, have a long timing constraint for every request type. Right? That's the idea. The idea was to optimize performance. You could always say, OK, I have these 100 timing constraints. I'm going to take the maximum and everything is going to take that time. That would be even worse than today. That's even worse case. But today we have these finer granularity based on the different commands and what's, what's following it. It complicates the memory control, but it buys you more performance. We'll see tomorrow that actually you could do even better than this because even these timing constraints are not, uh, are, the, are worst case within their own uh, domain. Okay, on top of this, you need to keep track of many resources to prevent conflicts. Channels, banks, ranks, data bus, address bus, command buses, row buffers, there's a lot. So resource tracking is important. Uh, you need to handle DRAM refresh, clearly. And you have some elasticity in that. So for example, you can push the refreshes for a while, you can pull the refreshes in, meaning that you don't have to do it exactly at 64 milliseconds. The current standards give you some, <coughs> some flexibility so that you can actually do the scheduling better. But you still need to do it. Uh, and you need to manage power consumption. And on top of that, now we're going to a bit higher level, you need to optimize for performance and quality of service in the presence of the constraints, right? Reordering is not simple. We've, we've said that memory controllers employ it, but there was a long, uh, uh, for, for some time, GPUs didn't want to employ row hit first memory scheduling because it's more complex compared to first come, first serve. First come, first serve, actually, if you look at old Intel Pentium 4 memory controllers, they're first come, first serve. They didn't even take advantage of the row buffer. At that time, memory controller was actually off chip. <laughs> it had a you had a separate chip for the memory controller. Later, they moved to row hit first, and that complicated the memory controller. GPUs had the same trade-off. They basically said, oh, we have a lot of memory controllers, and reordering is expensive because you need to have additional circuitry. So they wanted to make the best out of first come, first serve. Uh, but that didn't work out too well, I think. So uh, a lot of old memory controllers are doing reordering, as far as I know today, uh, to take advantage of the row, row buffer. Uh, and of course, on top of this, there's a performance, but there's a fairness and quality of service, right? And that is also a function of the memory controller today because it's really sent at the center of the universe, right? You have the GPU requesting some bandwidth demands. You have this hardware accelerator that has some deadlines. And memory controllers actually consider all of that today. Maybe they don't do it in the best way, but they have to consider it. And they're designed to consider it. So these are some timing constraints. You can take a look at the papers that I mentioned. Uh, and this is covering some number. Uh, for example, after you do a write, there's a write recovery time so that you can access, you can, do, you can send another command to the bank. It takes some time. It's 12 DRAM cycles, as you can see. Uh, yeah. OK, and, and these papers actually clarify these constraints really well. You can read the data sheets, but data sheets are sometimes not very clear. But these papers that I mentioned to you uh, clarify why these timing constraints exist and what they are. Actually, this is an example uh, over here that basically shows examples. So whenever you activate DRAM, uh, you need to wait. Uh, you, you start ch the chart sharing process. And after some time, the sense amplifier kicks in and figures out whether the values are 1 and 0. And at that point, you can actually read. And that timing constraint between activate and a read or write is about 15 nanoseconds TRCD. Right? It's basically the timing constraint between a row command and a column command, activate to read and write. And its scope is bank. Basically, the timing constraint needs to be satisfied at the bank level. But as you can see over here, there are some, as I said earlier, write to read 
timing constraint is how long you need to wait before you dare read after a write. It's a rank level constraint because it, the, the, the DRAM bus is shared uh, between uh, all the banks in the same rank. So this is just, I think, 10 of these examples, right? Not, not that many. So after read or write, uh, so you can only pre-charge the array after the voltage on the bit lines are actually really stable. You can read or write from the sense amplifiers even before the voltage on the bit lines are fully charged. That's why there's a timing constraint that says, oh, now you can read or write. But if you really want to pre-charge the array, uh, you need to wait a little bit longer such that the bit lines are stable, such that the circuitry that pre-charges it can actually pre-charge it uh, correctly. And you, you can see that there is another constraint over there, this TRAS. TRAS is how long you need to wait after an activate to a pre-charge. <coughs> That's about 35 nanoseconds in this particular technology over here in that data sheet. And pre-charge, actually, after you issue the pre-charge command, uh, uh, from pre-charge to activate, you need to wait about 13 to 15 nanoseconds, as you can see over here. OK, so there's a reason for all of these constraints, physical reason. Uh, and now you know exactly, because it's really designed to fit how long it takes, how long each operation takes. But even then, it, it has a large margin because of the temperature effect that we discussed earlier, right, that I mentioned. And this is another paper that talks about that in a, in a different level, as you can see. I'm not going to go through that. So basically, the ARM controller design is actually difficult, but it's also becoming more difficult today. Uh, when Chuck made that comment to me, uh, about, uh, it was about 10 years ago. Yeah, that was around 2008 or so, actually. But today, it's much worse. Today, we're, we have even worse uh, constraints on the memory controller, as we've discussed. So, OK, let's talk about some ideas. I think after that, uh, we're going to be done for the day. So the reality is that it's difficult to optimize all these different constraints while maximizing performance, quality of service, and energy efficiency. And people have been developing a lot of heuristics, people including my group and myself. And this is a very fascinating area for me. Uh, so while we were actually thinking about this, uh, we had this dream also. Wouldn't it be nice if the DRAM controller automatically found a good scheduling policy on its own, right? This is, I think, a really nice thing. Maybe it's a pipe dream, but we'll see. <laughs> so the idea is, uh, now how do, how do you do that, right? Uh, the, the problem, as I said, is DRAM controls are difficult to design. It's very difficult for human designers to design a policy that can adapt itself very well to different workloads and different system conditions. Uh, and the, our, the idea that we had was to design a memory controller that adapts its scheduling policy decisions to the workload behavior and system con conditions using machine learning. This is circa 2007. Actually, when we started the work, it was about late 2006. And the paper got rejected when we f submitted the first time. <laughs> it was interesting. I have, all, I have all these memories about uh, like why things were rejected. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. But we can talk about that separately, maybe. Uh, OK, I think it's a really cool idea. Uh, of course, it has a lot of constraints, as we will see. But the, our observation, I think the key observation is uh, it's not about using machine learning. That's a very high level idea, right? Then the key thing is what do you use and what, what fits this problem best? And our observation was that reinforcement learning maps nicely to memory control. Uh, uh, basically, reinforcement learning is actually learning that we do, uh, humans do. Does anybody know about Pavlov's dogs? Ivan Pavlov? Yeah, you know about them, right? That's, Ivan Pavlov was uh, uh, one of the very prominent behavioral psychologists, basically. And he essentially discovered that if you, if you ring the bell, and after that you feed the dog, uh, and if you do it a few times, next time you ring the bell, the, the dog comes to you. <laughs> That's the idea. That's reinforcement, right? You ring the bell, the dog gets a reward. You ring the bell again, the dog gets a reward. You ring the bell, the, the dog gets a reward. And the next time you ring the bell, the dog is expecting a reward, so they will come. <laughs> or they will do whatever that you taught them to do, such that they will initiate the ring of the bell. So you could use it for that purpose also. Actually, people trained uh, pigeons to carry messages. Uh, B.F. Skinner uh, was another very famous behavioral psychologist. He trained pigeons in the Second World War to carry messages for him, exactly using these uh, principles of reinforcement learning. And he was very, actually, he was very hard-headed in the sense that he said, this is the only principle of learning. <laughs> Meaning there's no other principle than reinforcement. Everything can be mapped back to reinforcement in learning. 
I'm not sure about that, really. <laughs> but, but I think it's a very strong principle, clearly. And the idea that we had was uh, to use the memory control as a reinforcement learning agent that dynamically and continuously learns and employs the best scheduling policy because it's reinforced to do so. By some actions, it gets rewards, and it tries to, it basically figures out uh, to use those actions that maximizes the long-term reward over time. That's the idea. And there's a lot of reinforcement learning theory, actually. There's a beautiful book by Richard Sutton uh, on this, uh, if you're really interested in reinforcement learning. Uh, and right now, actually, it's becoming popular again uh, because people are using a lot of deep reinforcement learning techniques that combine deep networks and reinforcement learning at the same time. Uh, we don't do deep networks here. Uh, I think that will complicate the design a lot more over here. But again, uh, the idea is very simple. You have this agent, reinforcement learning agent, dog, in this case the memory controller, takes an action, the environment responds in some way, uh, changes the state, and uh, the agent gets a reward. Right. And then it takes an action based on the current state uh, that it has. So you can uh, have the scheduler, uh, actions are the scheduled commands, the scheduler com uh, schedules a command, observes what happens on the data bus, and data bus utilization is a reward function in this case. Basically, if it's utilized, you get a positive reward. If it's not utilized, you don't get a reward. And it observes a state, and then to determines which action to take based on the expected reward, based on that state and the action pair. In this given state, which action should I take to maximize my long-term reward? I think in this case, long-term is important because you don't want to maximize the reward at, that, at the next cycle. Because in the end, you would like to maximize overall data bus utilization, assuming that's the metric. We, and we chose that as the metric, and I'll justify that in a little bit. You really want the long term. And if you want to do the long term reward, actually, you need to go and read the paper. But this is uh, basic reinforcement learning theory. And you need to learn the actions, uh, learn to choose the actions that maximize this function uh, that takes into account the current reward, uh, previous reward, previous reward, previous reward, dot, dot, dot. Basically, it's, it's a function of the past rewards in a weighted uh, fashion. OK, and this is very simple now, right? You basically dynamically adapt the memory scheduling policy via interaction with the system at the runtime. Uh, what you need to do is you need to associate system states and actions with long-term reward values. Each action at a given state leads to a learned reward. So for this, you need a table. Now the question is, how do you design that table? You index that table with the state, current state. And we're going to talk about how do you represent the state. And uh, you, need, you index that also with a proposed action to take. And then that gives you a reward value. And you compare that reward value to all of the possible other actions that you could take in that state. So let's assume that you have 16 possible actions that you can take. You index this table with 16 <coughs> state action pairs. State is the same action pairs. Uh, and you need to design such that you get 16 values and th compare those 16 values. And these values should be indicative of the long-term reward, long-term data bus utilization that you're going to receive, assuming you pick that action. Right? That's the idea. Now, that design is, of course, important how to design that. And there are multiple learning mechanisms. And the, this paper actually talks, uh, talk, uses Q-learning, which is a form of reinforcement learning. But of course, how do you design that table is discussed in the pa paper. And we don't really have time to discuss it. Maybe we should really assign this paper as a required reading so that you're, you enjoy the uh, ideas. OK, basically, you schedule the command with the highest estimated long-term reward value after you get it out of that table right? in each state. But even designing that table is not easy. I will, uh, that's, that's where the paper spends some time. And we're going to talk about that as one of the disadvantages potentially. Right? And you need to continuously update the reward values for state action pairs based on feedback from the system. And what is the feedback from the system? That's the data bus utilization. That's a simple metric in this case. And uh, basically, what are the states? State is actually anything that you input to the scheduler. And you're going to see some of the states that we have. It could come from the core also. It doesn't need to be restricted to the transaction queue, which is the buffer in the memory controller. And the action is the action that's taken by the scheduler, which command you schedule. And the reward is observed on the data bus. And you weight the reward over time, such that you try to maximize the long-term reward value. That's calculated somehow. So for this to work, you need to define these functions. Basically, you need to define a reward function. Uh, you need to, decide, to figure out what are your state attributes that you need to monitor and that you need to index your table with, and what are the actions that are possible. So let's talk about the reward function. 
so as I said, the goal is to maximize long-term data bus utilization. Why is it a good goal? Uh, you could argue that it may not be a good goal. It's a good goal under certain conditions, right? If, if for example, uh, you're running a single thread, or if you're uh, running multiple threads that are cooperating with each other, and your progress is dependent on how much data you can deliver per second, then this is actually a very good thing. It may not be a good thing if you have different threads that are independent of each other. Uh, then you, you, you need to define your reward function in terms of some quality of service metric as well, right? Because this has no consideration of quality of service if you think about it. It's trying to maximize data bus utilization. If a thread has very nice data bus utilization, it's going to be prioritized somehow, right? Uh, because it's not going to buy you better data bus utilization to prioritize some other thread that doesn't, uh, that doesn't naturally increase the reward function. So this is really important in any machine learning. I think it's very fundamental. Your reward function, at least in this sort of machine learning, needs to be very carefully uh, designed. Otherwise, you may be biasing things for a particular application or whatever. OK, so in this case, uh, you get a plus one reward for scheduling read and write commands and zero at all other times. So it's very simple, right? Because read and write commands immediately uh, uh, utilize the data bus. Of course, we're not doing uh, the utilization. Uh, we're not keeping track of the utilization only in the next cycle. But if, for, if somehow uh, whatever you schedule right now somehow affects data bus utilization five cycles later, that gets reflected in the reward function because we actually accumulate the rewards uh, this way. And you can read the paper for that. OK, state attributes, this is actually not so easy. How do you dis define what should be the state attributes? And uh, uh, what we did in this case was feature selection, basically. We looked at, I think, maybe hundreds of state attributes that you could imagine potentially in a system. And we ran a lot of simulations to figure out, oh, what are the best state attributes, assuming you already have this reinforcement learning controller. And these were the state attributes that we came up with. I think it's seven or eight over here. Uh, so this is the part that's left to humans. And maybe this could potentially be explored using machine learning as well. But there needs to be some input that says, oh, these are the state attributes that might be interesting. Otherwise, the state space is huge, right? And clearly, you don't want to have a state space that has 500 attributes uh, because that makes your tables huge. That's the big problem. Ideally, you would like to index everything with all of the, this mess of state that you have, but then your tables become huge. In the end, you have to be realistic. Uh, so these are the things that we found were the most important. Number of reads, number of writes, number of load misses in the request buffer, number of pending writes, and ROB heads, reorder buffer heads, waiting for the reference row. So there's a row that's being referenced, and how many, of, uh, how many writes are waiting for it, and how many uh, requests in different cores that are at the head of the reorder buffer. Basically, all these requests in the reorder buffer are waiting for it. You can see that this needs to be input to the feature selection mechanism to be able to capture that. And request relative order in the reorder buffer. How old is it in its processor? So these are all indexed using a hashing function that's described in the paper to form your state. Now that's your state encoding. Uh, and you use that and the action together to index into a table that will give you the estimated long-term reward value. And these are the actions that we looked at. Activate, write. Now, this is actually obvious, I think. Uh, these are things that a memory controller sen can send. It could also decide to send a no operate. Okay. So I'm not going to go into more details since uh, we're going to leave early today, as I discussed. But these are some of the performance results at the time. Uh, uh, if you look at the scheduler, this is speed up over first 30, first come, first serve, row hit first scheduler on parallel applications. These are all actually, a lot of them are scientific applications. So for example, this does earthquake simulation. This does shallow water image modeling. I like the name, it's SWIM. <laughs> and yeah, these are interesting applications. FFT is obvious, hopefully. Uh, if you look at this, this is the baseline. And this is the performance improvement that you get with uh, reinforcement learning, 19%. It's actually not bad, uh, uh, given that the maximum that you can get is about 70% in this case. Going from first, first come, first serve, though these applications are arguably not the best applications over here, because some of them are memory intensive, yes, but modern applications are actually even more memory intensive. Uh, so maybe the, the headroom is actually more in the modern application. But these applications are actually very streaming. As a result, there's another data point that's interesting over here. Going from first come, first serve to row hit first schedule actually buys you a lot 
on average, about 42%. Well, you need to do the calculation over here, but it's really a lot uh, compared to this. It's, it's, it's more than 60% of this, right? So it buys you a lot of performance. Reinforcement learning on top of that, now its job is harder because a lot of the performance, uh, basic performance is left on, the, uh, is already captured by uh, FRFCFS, so you get 19%. And the benefits are actually uh, uh, consistent uh, as you increase the number of channels. Okay, so this is actually interesting, and there's a lot more to do in this area, I think, but let's talk about advantages and disadvantages, and then we can conclude. So as I said, this is actually a, a control that adapts the scheduling policy dynamically to changing workload behavior to maximize a long-term target. I think one of the big benefits is it reduces the designer's burden in finding a good scheduling policy. Now the designer specifies what system variables might be useful and what target to optimize, but not how to optimize it. So this how is a big uh, burden for the designer. Of course, like every idea, it has disadvantages and limitations. Like this is a black box, like with mach many machine learning techniques, and you always have, uh, you, you should always be careful about black box as a designer or an architect, because you don't know how it will behave, right? Uh, that's exactly the problem with some of the black boxes that people are designing today, I believe, because you need to ensure that those black boxes are not biased in some way or do, do work well under uh, many conditions, right? So this memory scheduler, we know that it's biased for data bus utilization, right? Clearly. Uh, and there's no way to get away from that uh, at this point. But also there's another disadvantage. Design is much less likely to implement what he or she cannot reasonably reason about, right? And also I think one of the big issues, how do you specify different reward functions that can achieve different objectives? Fairness, quality of service. I think this is really important and this is an open research area. And hardware complexity is always a concern. Uh, and this is always a concern without machine learning, but with the machine learning, it becomes an even bigger concern because a lot of the machine learning algorithms uh, require a lot of data and require these big tables that you need to manipulate. And it may not always fit. But I think this paper does a good job with the hardware complexity. Uh, what we added was only a 32 kilobyte table in the memory controller, which is not bad. <laughs> okay, and you can take a look at this paper. Uh, if you have interest in this, but we may assign that. So I think I'm right on time. Well, yeah. <laughs> Any burning questions? Okay. Otherwise, we'll continue tomorrow. Uh, we didn't do lecture 5B, but that, that'll happen tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow.